Okay, I think we're uh, I think we're live now. Uh, hopefully, if everything's working the way it's supposed to, uh, it's, uh, I'm Grant Lindeberg from uh, the Cardboard Pusher Podcast, and I'm here with Vocal Runky of uh, uh, well, designer extraordinaire, and uh, we're here tonight to talk about uh, well, mostly about his new game, but about uh, about a lot of things. Uh, how are you, Vocal? I'm great. Thanks, Grant, and hello, everyone. Happy to be uh, here. Yeah. Hello to uh, hello to everybody in uh, ACDC land. Uh, I hope the uh, I hope the uh, convention's been going well. I've been having to work through most of it, so I haven't been able to catch anything. But um, other than uh, I did stop by for the uh, the opening the opening uh, drinks with uh, Artie and Brant, and that was a that was a good fun time. So anyway, um, hopefully we've uh, hopefully we're out there. Uh, um, any is. Uh, Maybe if anybody's out there watching on YouTube, if you can just post a comment to let us know that we're being seen out there, that would be great. Just in case we're not, I will fire up my YouTube and see. Hey, yeah, great. Looks like everything's good. Okay, well, um, uh, the it's a uh, it's very it's a very odd feeling to be um, doing doing things live without being able to hear the audience. But I'm glad I can read you. I can read you guys. Um, anyway, to uh, to get on to what we're going to talk about tonight, um, Vocal, you've got a new game, and um, you know you've designed a lot of games a lot of uh, a couple of really important series with the coin and the levian campaign uh but this is neither one of those what uh, that's right uh, what 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 brought you to to sort of finally get off the track of, uh, of those two <laughs> big series uh yeah thanks well uh i, I uh, in a way both of those series this is just something i'm just so delighted by I have, have a life of their own right i mean they they don't really need need me and uh, so I'm interested in in exploring other things. And uh, this um, game, uh, Coast Watchers, certainly did not come out of the blue. That it has a lineage like like any other game design. And in particular, it comes from my desire to look at uh, in in military simulations a field that I used to make my living by, which is intelligence work. And and the lineage indeed comes from that work where I. Did design for games in the classroom to train intelligence analysts, and I did a, a, a co-designed a game called Kingpin: The Hunt for El Chapo, which was about the Mexican hunt for the drug lord. And it was right. about it was it was about um, how do we you know take a, a, a in this case an individual who's a target of law enforcement in this case who's very very hard to track and find and has all kinds of defenses and how do we you know find and, and apprehend that person. And so that design gave me several ideas of, you know, there are a lot of cases like that in history. And that led to a, a game design of mine called Hunt for Blackbeard, which I designed many years ago, um, but it's still not published. <laughs> but it but is going. It's, 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 it's coming. coming out with Fort Circle, right? It is coming out with Fort Circle. And it is in art by the, the very uh, talented artist and game designer, Mark Rodrigue. Who did bayonets and tomahawks? So yeah, great, great, uh, fellow great affinity, Canadian. <laughs> fellow Canadian, yes, and great affinity for the 18th century, if you know him. Yeah, and right. so he's doing wonderful art for Hunt for Blackbeard, and so that is coming. So I wanted to see where else I could take lessons learned from both of those designs, because each of this kind of an evolution. In other words, Kingpin that that worked very, very differently mechanically from how Hunt for Blackbeard works. But there are things in, you know, that was like, oh, let me build on that or whatever. Anyway, and so I wanted to see where else could I use some of the lessons learned from designing Hunt for Blackbeard and apply that larger military situations. And I've long had an enduring interest in the uh, uh, World War II Pacific, 
um, Adore Combat Commander Pacific by the Jensen's, for example. So I play a lot of games in that setting, and uh, and I I came across the story of the Australian Coast Watchers, which are you know they're famous to anybody who knows. Pacific World War II, the Coast Watchers is quite familiar in terms of who they were, what they were doing in the South Pacific. So, although the, I, I, w I was listening to a podcast from New Zealand about them just mm -hmm. this morning, what you know, and and they were, uh, I was it was a grandson of somebody who was an actual Coast Watcher was the was the person I was listening to, and uh -huh. he was so frustrated that even people at home in New Zealand. Uh, didn't know enough about them. He felt that it's like yeah. a forgotten history. Yeah, and that may be the case in New Zealand. And I, I don't know for sure in Australia, but certainly there's a lot of Australian war memorial material about them and vi videos and, and, of course, books. And they were principally Australians working with in, indigenous teams of mostly policemen in New, New Guinea and the Bismarcks, uh, right. uh, New Britain and, is, and the Solomon the Islands. It was uh, indigenous from the Cook Islands. From the Cook Islands, okay. But they actually, they were, you can tell the Cook Islands, they, it was a very broad program and it did involve New Zealand. And it's like, I think it's less well known that there were New Zealanders. Yeah, he said were, that there was something like 70 stations. Yes, so it spanned, now they became famous in the, what, was called the South Pacific or Southwest Pacific, right? So in that that theater, and especially in the in the in the Solomon Islands, uh, 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 Bougainville to, to Guadalcanal. But yes, it was a it was quite a an enterprise, and I think perhaps that reflect that interview might have reflect the fact that the the the, the breadth of it and who participated um, uh, is less well known. Right, because and, they, they didn't know where the Japanese were coming, so. They they spread a wide net, right? And then the Japanese right. only come through certain chunks of it. And and another interesting thing about it is it weren't it wasn't specifically to be a behind Japanese lines intelligence network. That was actually not the idea. The right. idea was just early warning. It was just we're gonna recruit some civilians, we're gonna give them a radio, they're gonna be on the coast somewhere of Australia, for example. And we're going to tell them, watch for any unusual ships, especially coming from the north, and report it. That was supposed to be it, right? And what happened was these folks, these stations, these coast watchers, and their, their local teams, because they absolutely vital to their job was the cooperation of, of um, uh, all the, you know, the general population that lived there, right? right? Those that happened to be in these islands that were conceived of as sort of an outer fence was the, the, the phrase that the commander at the time, Eric Felt used, an outer fence of warning in places like New Ireland, New Britain, Bougainville, these northern islands. Well, the Japanese came in and some of these coast watchers, they tried to pull out. A lot of other ones got captured and a number of other ones agreed to stay behind, were given... Uh, reserve naval commissions, reserve commissions in the Australian Navy, and then were basically an undercover, you know, it, it was, it, that was a, that was an adaptation to the emergency of the Japanese invasion. Right. It's crazy. The island, uh, the island you're on gets overrun and you decide to stay. And then it's you yeah. and whoever locally might help you. That's right. Else is living there. Right. But you, you That's were, right. On your own. Well, you are very, yes, you are. I mean, you're, so you're not really on your own because you have that teleradio. Right. You're going to get supplies. You're going to get instructions. You're going to get codes to use. Uh, and they were sent not just food supplies, but uniforms. You know, the idea was if you have a uniform, you're less likely to be killed, executed as a spy if the Japanese take you. So that was right. then, you know, para dropped to you. Uh, and because you knew the local population, you could survive uh, and you could be effective in, in, in reporting on the Japanese as long as you kept the other people who lived there around you largely on your side, on the Allied side. Right. And, and you keep those people on your side. And there's also a it, it, you have to kind of keep moving too, right? There's like, you, you yeah, they, 
relocated a lot. Uh, and they, so first of all, this was a big success story. They were extremely effective, the Coast Watchers, in helping the Allies defeat the Japanese. And uh, uh, Admiral Halsey, uh, uh, you know, American Admiral Halsey is credited with saying, is attributed to, to have said, the Coast Watchers saved the South Pacific, you know, the Coast Watchers saved Guadalcanal and Guadalcanal saved the South Pacific. Right, is a right. So, so, so I think celebrated and, and acknowledged at, at the time, they were very, very successful. But I think what's less well known is how much pressure they were under. And if you're, you, absolutely, the Japanese are patrolling for them. Uh, they're, it, they want to be on the coast to see what's happening. They're coast watchers. But the, they constantly had to relocate further inland, into the, up into the hills, into the jungles, so to avoid Japanese um, patrols. And the more that, that the Japanese put that pressure on, the less able the Coast Watchers are to do their job. Because one, one principle here is the disruption of your network. I don't necessarily have to actually catch you to defeat you if you're, if you're a, a, a fugitive of some kind, if you're an intelligence operative in this case, right? If they have to move their radio all the time or in moving these radios, these teleradios, they were, they were portable, but it took like a train of carriers to, right, to, right. to carry all that no, could, generator and all. Affordable today. Yeah, right. It's like relocatable might be a better word for them and everything else. And so the, and, and the more they had to, and they had to, to report on the Japanese, they had to be at a vantage point. They had to be someplace close enough to the enemy to, 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 to watch them, right? To see what's going on. Um, or to be able at least to send spies into and get back and get reports, right? Into the Japanese facilities to get them. They did a lot of that also very effectively. So, so what this dynamic that, that we can capture in a game is, first of all, what is it, you know, how does this, what does this network have to do to survive, to exist behind enemy lines, just operating it, you know, expanding it? What can it do to help the allied war effort if it's effective? And what are the Japanese doing to disrupt it and shut it down? And that includes the possibility of taking, obviously catching these people, you know, and, and taking them, them captive. But perhaps you can also, less than that, perhaps you can just disrupt them enough to execute your Japanese military operations without the Coast Watchers having betrayed too much warning and intelligence information to the Allied forces to to, to blunt your your uh, activities as as a military. So that's what the game is about. In some cases, the the Coast Watchers, I mean, they were successful just in just in seeing in in alerting um, the Allies to what like where the where the planes were coming from. Like it, it wasn't all spying, right? Sometimes it was actually like. Oh my God! Look at all the look at all. There's got to be a carrier, uh, yes. you know, northwest of us or whatever. Because look at all the planes right. in the sky suddenly. So there are kind of two. If you think about, you know, in military affairs, there's the the the, the strategic level, the operational level, and the tactical level. Right? We're pretty right, familiar right. with those terms, right? So you have the same thing in intelligence. There's strategic intelligence, which is sort of what are the you know enemy's general plans and their overall capabilities, what's happening politically. And the U.S. was getting quite a bit of that, for example, from, from, from code breaking, right? Where you're looking at the whole Pacific and, you know what, the concentration of carriers is over here near, you know, aiming at Midway, not aiming at Australia, whatever. So you've got sort of strategic intelligence. Then you've got operational intelligence, which is, you know, where more locally are they massing forces? How many ships are at the port in Rabaul? You know, um, uh, you know is there, or what is the state of readiness? And fortification at this or that base and so forth. The Japanese are building an airfield over here on this island, right? That's kind of week by week, month by month. You want to have updates and details on that. And then there's tactical. And that's what you're describing, which which uh, we term warning, tactical warning, indications right. of warning, distant early warning, that kind of thing. It's like a radar. And in this case was possibly the biggest contribution actually that the Coast Watchers made. And that is that the Japanese, uh, especially during Watchtower, the American landing on Guadalcanal, but it was true actually throughout 42, very important, that the Americans could take on the Japanese in the air if they could get their slow fighters up high enough and be ready when the Zeros came. Then they could dive down on them with speed and take on the Zeros okay. And they could also 
damage from Japanese naval aviation strikes, torpedo bombing like, if they dispersed their transports ahead of time and formed the proper screens with their escort ships. But you, you can't operate like that all the time, right? You, you want to have. And so the Japanese, their bases are up in Rabaul and Kavieng, their main bases at the time of Watchtower, are up in New Ireland, New Britain, in the north. And they would take off and fly these missions to Guadalcanal to try to hit the Americans as they're you know, supporting their activity on the beach or to knock out Henderson Field or whatever. And that flight path took you right down the Solomon Islands. There's like a chain of islands that these aircraft right. are coming down. The first of which in the Solomons is Bougainville. And they were two really excellent Coast Watcher leaders on Bougainville, Jack Reed and Paul Mason. And they basically gave something like two hours warning to Guadalcanal as they saw, just as you described, they saw, they'd see 40 Bettys flying overhead right. and they would radio, they'd get on the radio and no code because this was like tactical, he's quick, right? It's they'd get on the radio to Guadalcanal and they'd say, 40 bombers headed your direction, you know, and first Jack Reed at the Northern tip uh, near Buca would say that, then they'd fall fly past Paul Mason, he would say, yep, here they come, you know, confirmation, if you will, or if one missed them, the other one would. And then there's a chain of coast watchers all the way down, oh, down the right. islands, and each one is, you know, that sees it. So you've got a whole network there, and it's like over the horizon radar. So in the beginning, they didn't, the Americans didn't even have radar at Henderson Field. And even when they got it, that radar gives them maybe 30 minutes warning because they're horizon, right? But you've basically got human beings on a radio that are, you know, that are doing that for you. And that was tremendously valuable for the, the uh, so this is like this, the, 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 you know, kind of exemplary case is, is the Americans, the Cactus Air Force defending Guadalcanal, tremendously effective for them in blunting these Japanese uh, efforts by, by air to, 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 to throw the Americans out of there. And the same was true for ships. So the, the Tokyo Express, which we know well, same thing. Um, Paul Mason is, you know, at the southern end of Bougainville off the Shortlands Anchorage there. He sees the destroyers leaving. He's like, you know, here they come. Tokyo Express headed your way. And the Americans are ready to try to, to, to counter that and gauge. Or if it's a larger cruiser force, maybe they want to avoid it, you know, or maybe they want to be ready to engage it in a ship, etc. So that's an example. But that's going on throughout. You know, that's going on uh uh, before the Americans get to Guadalcanal, the, 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 during the Coral Sea um, battle operations by the Japanese, it's going on in the Japanese efforts to, to take and uh, uh, exploit uh, Buna in New Guinea and come across the Kokoda track at Port Moresby. It's happening during the Allied counteroffensive of Operation Cartwheel. And the Coast Watchers are, are providing that kind of, uh, first of all, the reporting information, what is the state of these Japanese forces, the warning information, here they come. And then there's other things they're doing. They are finding and rescuing uh, servicemen, uh, downed air crew, right, sailors. Yeah. And that's tremendously important for, first of all, for, for allied morale. That you know, you, you're, you're, you go down in, in the ocean, uh, in enemy waters, there's a good chance the first person you see is actually going to be a friendly who's going to pick you up in a canoe, bring you to a coast watcher, and then you'll get picked up by a PT boat or whatever, right? right. So that's really, <laughs> but it also meant the allies are preserving their pilot cadre because you know what a difficulty the Japanese had maintaining the quality of their air crew over the course of the war. They were losing. Right. That, that, was a, and, that was one of the big factors of, of, of the air war was the, the Japanese, the quality of their pilots just diminished, 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 diminished. And, right. And so, and if you were, so think about that. And you, so you're taken off from Rabaul or wherever, you're going to go do some, you know, air combat near Guadalcanal. If you get shot down, that's it. Your career is over. You know, you're going to be a POW or you're going to be dead. And that's true even most of the time. It's true even in territory that's ostensibly Japanese occupied. Because the, because if the coast watchers and the, lo and, the, and the local people, the Solomon Islanders, for example, are working together, they kind of, 
they kind of control more acreage, if you will, in that territory than the Japanese actually do in their in their bases, right? Right. And so course. and so and the Coast Watch are there kind of organizing that, right? Organizing that kind of um, it's not passive resistance, but it's nonviolent in most cases, resist by by in, by indigenous people. And they're organizing that connection again to the mothership, the allied bases in Port Moresby and Guadalcanal and wherever to be able to have these servicemen rescued. And then similarly, there are other refugees, not, not, not service people, not downed pilots, but whoever uh, who is under Japanese occupation and you know the Japanese are a threat to them, they might be missionaries, they might be other civilians who, the, the, who would like to get out and the allies wanna get them out. And so the, the Coast Watchers are participating in that. So that's kind of a, you know, an additional important but side function that they fulfilled that that is also in the game. Uh, Fred uh, mentioned that Ian Toll talks about the Coast Watchers in his specific trilogy, and yeah, that's the that was the first time I'd read about them. I didn't know anything about them until I read that trilogy. I mean, being a Canadian, um, you know, we don't we don't grow up with a lot of knowledge about uh, the Pacific War. Our uh, our Pacific War started and ended in uh, um, Hong Kong in 1940. That was that, right? It's or 41, yeah. I guess. Uh, so uh, it, it felt like uh, it, learning about them was like, oh my God, this is these are like these guys are ex as exciting as uh, European spies, or you know right. what's going on in Portugal, or you know, in all those crazy places where people were risking risking their lives, uh, yeah. often out of uniform. Yeah, and uh, of course they were treated often treated as spies if they were caught, and and right. several of them were caught. Uh, you know, the Japanese did have some successes in that regard. And in some of those cases, they're they're beheaded. Right. As right. spies. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course, because, <laughs> uh, I mean, they'd be, they'd just be, the Japanese would be just awfully mad about the whole, uh, about their existence period. They would take any, yeah. any reasonable opportunity to be, to dispose of them, I'm sure. Yeah. And they had that opportunity because it wasn't at all, uh, foretold or guaranteed that the um, that let's say Australian uh, an Australian coast watcher would have the cooperation of other people living on that given island. Um, after all, these were colonial mandates, so you had you know European types as sort of overseers, and there's that sort of whole colonial complex colonial. Um, you know, colonizer colonized relationship going on. So you have and, a they they they're, they're in some cases they're as uninterested in having the Japanese on their island as they are having uh, the Australians on their island. In some of these cases, they just want everybody off their island. I suppose that's right. So, for example, there's there's some views uh, that that we have from that time from the the indigenous islanders that hey look these are just Two different, you know, white tribes fighting each other. They both want a lord over us. What? Do we, what? There was some of that, um, and another problem for the allies, for the Coast Watchers in particular, was that the longer that the Japanese occupier was there, the more it looked like, hey, the Japanese are going to be here. That's it. You know, they're in charge, and the penalties for failing to cooperate with the Japanese are severe. And so the Coast Watchers in these northern islands, where it's taken the Allies a while to get there, right, are in the position of saying, you know, hang tight, you know, stick with us, suffer through this, the Allies are coming, you know. Well, that the credibility of saying that goes down sort of month after month. And in, so you have in the, there's a kind of a geographic division here. Like in Papua, you had a lot of recruitment and Papuan infantry brigades, Fighting or battalions rather fighting uh, with the uh, with the uh, allies in the Solomon Islands, you had pretty solid solid cooperation with the allies against the Japanese. But so in the southern areas, New Britain, the island where uh, where Rabaul is, the main base, very different story. And in the north, in the Bismarcks in, in New Ireland as well. And then critically on Bougainville, it really pivoted. That you for 1942, there's pretty 
great ability of these coast watchers to operate on Bougain Field. But going into 1943, it's getting more and more difficult. They have to move more and more often. They're losing more and more local support as the Japanese are able politically, if you will, to tighten their grip on that island to the point where eventually these ace coast watchers who were responsible for giving the, the, the best early warning to Guadalcanal in September 42, they have to, in summer 43, they have to evacuate the island completely because it's just become too hostile and therefore they, they're, they're just under too much threat from the Japanese. Was it, so when that island got too hostile, was the, those particular islanders feeling like they, they were throwing their lot in more with the Jap? They thought that they'd do better under Japanese occupation than, than not? Well, I, I think I would put it this way that they don't have a, they don't necessarily feel they have a choice. Right. Because right. the Japanese, the Japanese have been there for over a year and the coast, you know, they're here. You know, I don't see, I don't see any U.S. Marines here. I don't see the Australian army here. Right. There's 300 the Japanese soldiers. The Japanese, one the Japanese army is here and they're getting stronger and stronger. Right. What, what choice, you know, what choice do I have? That That's who's in charge. Yeah. Yeah. Easy calculation. So, Yeah. Well, um, should we talk a bit about uh, how how you turned all of this research into this sure. into the game? Sure. So, um, so an aspect I mentioned Hunt for Blackbeard, and an aspect in Hunt for Blackbeard that I had to deal with, and this is an old um, challenge in tabletop games and war games, and it comes up in a lot of naval games. How do we do hidden information? Right. How, you know, how do we show that I know something about where your forces might be, but not where they are, and I'm searching for them? So we have, as you know, there's screens and written down logs and blocks, all kinds of techniques that we have to provide that fog of war. But one kind of, you know, a conundrum was if you were searching somewhere, you had to communicate that search to the to your opponent who has this information about where they're where that you know, that the enemy's forces are, what you're searching for. And if you have a system where a, a situation in history where search is, is limited, it's local, if you will, if I say, well, I'm searching here, you, I just gave away that my forces are in range of searching right. there, right? right? So this comes up in, in, in Jutland, in that campaign, it comes up in Pacific. So it's kind of a similar similar thing that I wanted to be able to have secret searching going on where I'm getting information from you, but you don't know where I'm looking. Right. It's the, the, the idea of, of not giving away where you are just by the fact of, of your search. So yes. That, and, a- and, and, and to how to affect that in a way that's, you know, fun to play yeah, yeah. in a, sure. and on the tabletop. Right. Okay. Jerry White so, was trying to figure out that problem with his Atlantic chase game. Right. And that's a, yes. a much bigger scale, yes. but he and, with that whole and, trajectory thing. Right. And the, and, and the, the central solution that he found, this is a very different solution yeah, yeah. is he chose a situation, the battle of the Atlantic in which he could plausibly say, you don't actually know any more than I do where your own forces are. Right. And you can see where I'm searching, but it doesn't help you that much because you don't, neither of us knows where they are. So that's, that's right. I would argue. Out the middle of the ocean. Right. So that's not hidden information. That's neither of us know. Right. True. Right? That's true. Okay. Yeah. So his system relies on that premise, but that's rare. That's rare that we can plausibly argue it's the Battle of Midway, and I don't, I'm the US, and I don't know where the Yorktown is. Right, where's Zoom? Right now, he's going to make it. He's going to he's going to do it in Pacific Chase. We'll see. But yeah, yeah. I'm facing know. a different problem. All right. So what I needed to do was, you know where it is. I'm going to look. I might or might not find you, and you don't know whether I found you or not. And sometimes you don't even know if I'm where I'm looking. Right. How do I do that? Because I want to have a situation in in, in an intelligence battle in a reconnaissance battle, where. I know, and you don't know I know. <laughs> okay, all right. So in Hunt for Blackbeard, there are spaces on the board and each space has one block all the time. And that block might be nothing or that mock might be the pirate ship, okay? And if I am looking for the pirate ship, if I'm the hunters, 
and I'm secret, I'm able to secretly search. I just say, hey, close your eyes for a minute, opponent, pirate, opponent. I look at a block. I don't cheat, right? I play honestly. I look at a block and I put it back. Now you open your eyes. Now you know I was searching, but you don't know where and you don't know what I found. And I might have just found you. I might have just found your camp, or I might have nothing, or I might have eliminated this part, whatever. Anyway, so that's how that works. The blocks, not a block game where the block is a force and you can see it moving across the map, and here comes this big force. I don't know how strong it is or what it is, but I see you moving. It's not that. The block. Right is location. Every location has a block. The block might be nothing or it might be the target. Okay, so that mechanic is in Coast Watchers. The, and you'll, the, you, as we have on the screen here, you can kind of see part of the board. The board shows, in effect, an intelligence network. It's a network of stations, of Coast Watching stations. These are all historical stations. And there's a block at every one. And that block might be nothing is happening, you know, Tropical breezes, palm trees, coconuts, that's it. Or it might be a coast watcher is there active, or it might be a downed air crew, a ref or gorillas. So we have these 32 spaces on the board. Most of the scenarios, they're all they all have these blocks, and the coast watcher player, the ally player, sees that side's entire network, and the Japanese player just sees. The black back the blocks and the Japanese are now searching. See, they have this, the search problem. Each side has a game, but the Japanese have the search problem. They're searching for these coast watchers to try to chase them, disrupt them, and take them if they can. Right in in the in the game, and you know, I'll, we'll we'll uh, we'll bring up uh, the vassal module and and uh, get into it in a bit. But the the allied player has the blocks. Uh, and those are the only blocks in the game. The Japanese pieces are, are actually counters because both sides know where the Japanese uh, forces are. Basically, there's to a degree less, yeah, yeah less hit, so, less hit, not, to so not I, totally. I could have used these blocks for the Japanese also, but it would have gotten too crowded on the board. So the Japanese have. So first of all, every space has a different control status. It's Japanese occupied. It's Allied held, right? Some of them are bases, allied bases, Japanese bases. Most of them are not. So they're little control markers that show that. So little uh, Japanese flags for the Japanese. But on the back side, the Japanese can do a military buildup there. And that is hidden from the allies. Right. Yes. Don't use blocks for that, not just for the space, but because they are not as numerous. That is to say, every turn, the Japanese typically might do a couple of these buildups. And they're only two, three, four, at most five turns. It's a fairly short game. And so I am asking the Japanese to more or less remember where things are. And if they want to check, they can just, you know, they can. But it's not like the need for the Japanese player to see this sort of network spread out. So there are secrets that the Japanese have. And similarly, when the Coast Watchers are observing, spying on the Japanese, they're looking for these military buildups. Right, that's what and they're that's one, of, that's one of their main missions. And if they succeed in that well, they're doing it secretly. That is, the Japanese might have concentrated some warships off of Bougainville. The Coast Watchers just saw it. They reported it for victory points. But the Japanese player doesn't know that. Right. Or maybe the, or maybe the Japanese player does know that. But that's something that has to be possible. So you're right. For that, we use... Um, a different fog of war mechanic that's very common, face down markers. And then there's a third one. The game also has cards, and, and each side has some hidden missions that I don't know exactly what I know generally what you're trying to do is the Coast Watchers if I'm the Japanese, and I don't generally what you're trying to do as the Japanese if I'm the Coast Watchers. But there are specifics. Are the Japanese planning to bomb Guadalcanal and send troops to Buna today? Right? I'm trying to find that out as the Coast Watchers, and that's in mission cards. And then, of course, each side has a number of assets, special things they have, Japanese right. barges and destroyers, um, uh, you know, uh, pro-Japanese sentiment on key islands, um, particular uh, individuals who are very effective for the Coast Watchers are represented, Japanese uh, admirals, you know, technology, allied air cover, code break, whatever, all those kinds of are going on, on in this, well. they're on cards. And 
So there's some hidden information there too. So there are three fog of war, limited information mechanics, you know, that I'm reaching for here, the cards, the counters, and the blocks. But the particular lineage of this, the, the thing that makes, I think, different, especially uh, in terms of mechanically, is that the way it uses blocks is similar to how blocks are used in Hunt for Blackbeard games that do that. Right, that, that idea of like, have your opponent look away for a second while you have a quick peek at that place that you're searching for the blocks. But the, with the, it makes sense to me for the counters for the Japanese because when you do those buildups, once, once the Japanese build up, let's say they put troops in a certain area or they build an airfield in a certain area, whatever they're doing, once they, once they do those buildups, they don't tend to change, right? It's like... They, they don't. Now they can, but it's inefficient. But the Japanese right. do have the opportunity for some deception in that regard if they don't care about the total number of buildups available. So, so one of the charms of these kinds of limited information systems where I have some information that you don't have, also release some information to you. I have a channel to select what information you get. We now have the possibility for deception. And right. so it's kind of like that. The Japanese can somewhere that they don't really need so that the allies will observe it and report back. And then the Japanese could pull it out if they want. So right. that can happen. It's not the most common thing to happen. If that does happen, the allies have wasted their time because you only get victory points as the Coast Watchers for accurate reporting, you know, not right. for something that's right. overtaken by events. Right. So, so it's the, that I know that you know that I know that like it's adding another layer into the deception here. If you, if you, if you let them know something and then you take it away afterwards. Right. However, most of the time, you're absolutely right. The Japanese are going to put down a few of these buildups here and there. What their missions are, it's on their cards. And when it's time to, uh, uh, you know, sum up the points for the Japanese to launch their operation or, or gain their victory points, they're just going to flip all those markers over and there's going to be an accounting at the end of the game. So in that case, like you say, any data points that are hidden, they're checkable. If you want to look under counter, you can always do that, of course, as the Japanese, and they don't change that much. You're right. right. That You bring up an interesting thing about how how the game works. The 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 first 80% of the game or 90% of the game is these buildups and the looking and the, the back and forth, the cat and mouse. But then the game, the scenarios end by the Japanese feeling like uh, we're in a position to launch uh, whatever it is, where, you know, whatever, uh, what it, whatever it is. And that's when the victory points get added up. Correct. That that's exactly right. So, so it, it, it's, and it's, I think I should add here, the, who, who, is, who do the players represent? So the, the allied player is largely representing the allied coast watching network itself. Uh, you're, you're larger, you're running your network and reporting on Japanese military activity. And, and, and that's you know, who you are. That's pretty clear. The Japanese player actually is in two chairs at the same time. Definitely in charge of the, the security effort, the counterintelligence effort that's trying to hunt down these coast watchers or at least disrupt them or at least understand where they are so you can avoid them. Um, so that's kind of part of what is player. But you're also, you have some control, some influence over the larger military uh, machine, the, the, the Navy and the Army um, that, that's fighting. And your missions have to achieving those military activities with the least amount of intelligence lost to the Coast Watchers possible. And so the Japanese player has, a, has decisions to make about which missions to pursue. They're very often mutually exclusive. And many of those missions described, which is called operations. Some missions are just, you know, build up some troops over here, do some construction over there. Many missions are operations, which mean that ships or aircraft are going to move across the map to a, to a target. And when the Japanese player decides, I'm going to launch one or more of those operations, and now is the time I'm going to do that, that, ends, that will end the game. Uh, that will be the accounting. And what happens then is we don't really resolve, it's not a game about the military battles. 
It's a game right. about the intelligence conflict, but we have to resolve where they go so that we can see how the Coast Watchers do in terms of warning to influence that battle. And so what's going to happen is the Japanese are going to start launching that operation, but the Coast Watchers are going to subtract points off of that score based on how well they're able to provide that tactical warning that we talked about. So we'll trace some path. Here's where the Tokyo Express is sailing, or here's where the torpedo bomb. Where are there Coast Watchers along the way that are getting on the radio and warning? That's all essentially negative points, points for the Coast Watchers to subtract off the Japanese score. Game over. Right, and, and then it's a it's a tally, and 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 the the intelligence. It, it, it's basically a, an intelligence score in terms of uh, who did better. I mean, the, the, like you say, the game isn't about whether the operation succeeds or not. It's about how well the Coast Watchers did or didn't do. Yeah, that's right. And so the the Jap to the Japanese, as far as the Japanese player controlling these military operations. What really is is what is the advice, right? That the that the security um, forces, the Japanese rear area security, right? The spy hunters, you know, what are they able to say in terms of, yeah, you, sh you know, this will go, this will come off, you know, where we have the Coast Watchers on the run, you know, uh, go ahead and, and launch that operation now. Well, cool. Uh, I guess what we should do is uh, put up the. Unless there's something else you want to talk about before we do this, but we should maybe scare, share the screen and sort of show what sure. the game looks like. And, you know, people can chime in with questions as we go. Uh, there. Or let's see. I think we don't need that to quite that. That'll give us a little better. <laughs> this is a uh, this is scenario D. Uh, how many scenarios have you got uh, made so, so far? So the game will have fifteen different situations. Uh, each a self-contained game, fairly short, and. Uh, you know, a training situation and then A through N spanning 1942-1943 in the South Pacific, and then four campaigns that link three situations each. And and I call them situations because the the basically the the the, the core intelligence and counterintelligence missions are the same, right? In each case. So why so many? The military situation is different. It's kind of the military environment for the intelligence work, if you will. And so, which is why I call them call them situations. And as you as you know, uh, if you know that the, the the history of the war in the Pacific, the South Pacific is quite quite the cockpit in 42, 43. and it's a very very dynamic military situation. The Japanese are invading and expanding. Uh, there's a stalemate uh, in in Papua and on Guadalcanal, and then the Allies are pushing back. And so that environment is changing. So what we're looking at here, this is. We're looking at just before the the Guadalcanal operation, just before Watchtower. This is the summer of '42. The Japanese have not yet landed at, at Buna at the top of the map. There, west is the top of the map, by the way. The uh, the the Allied player would be sitting along the left, right? You'd be looking at it from the south, from Australia. The Japanese from the north, from say Truk. Right, so the Japanese player is sitting on the right here. And I anyway. should say that we're looking at uh, we're looking at the board from the Allied players' point of view. So uh, all those uh, where we, where you see all those C's, uh, those are the Coast Watcher blocks, or there or there's nobody there blocks. But there, the the Japanese player can't see these; those are concealed. They're they're only right. visible uh, to the Allied player, uh, but on Vassal, this is the 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 Allied player sees it this way, and the the uh, Japanese player would see it just as blank blocks at this point. Exactly. So all those letter C's on the physical game would be blocks that are standing up facing the Allied player. And right now, no one's deployed. This is just the starting situation. There's just one block in every space, and there are little palm trees, meaning 
nothing happening there because the allies have not have not yet deployed their coast watchers you also see you know the japanese control markers the the brighter ones with the gold um, border those are japanese bases and then you also see some Japanese patrols. Uh, the orange ones are called police. And then there's some yellow ones called army that aren't deployed yet. Yeah, and guys. those are the, that just means that, so they're Japanese, wherever you see Japanese flags, they're Japanese forces here. But, um, but in some cases, they're actively patrolling, looking for people like the Coast Watchers. And in many cases, they're not. And so the patrols mean the Japanese are, are, are doing that. And if they have that, those orange police, that means they have the, uh, it's police because the police are the indigenous people. So it's the Japanese army working together with the local police to, to, to find the coast watchers. And so those are more effective than the Japanese army on their own. Right. And so this is the, this is, uh, the, the game set out, but we haven't actually finished the setup. There's a, there's a few things that need to be set up. The, uh, the, the allied player will need to um, put to insert his. He's this is a, some uh, some setup pieces yet where the uh, mm -hmm. I think that's like uh, five uh, five Perhaps. coast watchers and and uh, and one coast watcher with uh, a, a gorillas or something like that. Right. These are these are the stations that are already in place. But of course, it wouldn't be much fun or very realistic if the Japanese player starts out knowing by the scenario where they are. So we right. do give the allied player the ability to distribute them. So perhaps um, bring up the, let's have a look at this situation sheet. So this has like, it's like a scenario sheet in a tactical war game, if you will. So if you go to the situation information yeah, right, tab right there. Right here. There we go. Uh, pull up, hit situation D at the top middle. There it is. And if you can, there you go. So if you can go to the, scroll it to the top. It's about as high as I can get it, I think. There we go. Huh, it doesn't scroll to the top of the uh, sheet. Oh, there you go. Yeah, there this we go. The, this is the, in, in effect, this is the this is the, uh, the scenario, if you will. So it gives you the date, a little historical information, tells you where to put those control markers. And what you see on the map there is the same thing we were, the setup, and that there are going to be uh, two coast watchers are going to be in uh, allied held areas. And it looks like five coast watchers and gorilla will be in the Japanese held areas, two and ready. Japanese have some police. And you would go through a little setup routine, that allied setup box that you were just pointing to, the allies would go through that. It would assign them some missions and some assets. Uh, they deploy the Japanese player doesn't know where they're going. And then the Japanese gets get assigned some uh, some missions, some asset cards, and get to place patrol. They have some patrols that they get to distribute as well. So that's right. uh, that's how how you know how to set up uh, how do you know how to set up the game? And there's also these um, mission sheets as as well that, uh, show you what uh, what cards are in the game is in the scenario or um yes so the all the information you need to set up and play the game is on that one sheet that we were just looking at right the, uh here it's called map info but that's basically a scenario card that's going to sit next to the the game as you play right. but as well every situation has those two pages you just showed called that i just called intelligence brief it's supporting information it's basically an illustration of uh, what's possible in the game for, that just helps you guide your strategy. Uh, and this would just be, uh, these would be a couple pages in the background book and you know, players are free to ignore them if they want, they don't really need them. But if you wanted to get a look at where might the Japanese be building up? If you're the Coast Watcher player and like, okay, he's got all these mission cards, where might he be building up to score points and where might he be going? That's what that complicated looking map shows you. Right. It's kind right. of, in a way, it's sort of your intelligence requirements. Go find out if there's airplanes over here or ships over there. That's what that is. And then the other information is just what are the possible cards that the player might draw. So if you go to that um, uh, mission, 
uh, if you go to that, the, the next tab, cards. Yeah, so this is just the possibilities of what the Japanese missions are. And because that's so important to trying to figure out as the allies what the Japanese player is trying to do, it, I thought it'd be worthwhile just to show you the cards. You know, they're listed on the sheet. You can go look up what they are. But here it is just at a glance. These are all the things that the Japanese player might be trying to do in this game. Right. That's and, all that is. It's really supporting information as you form your strategy. Right. The, the key stuff is, like you said, on this scenario, uh, on, the, on this scenario card, really. That's right. And this, I, I've been through, you know, I've been working on the, the module. The, yeah, with, you've been uh, working with Will Bauer uh, to yeah. bring the playtest uh, Vassal module up to snuff, and I appreciate that. And Great these, um, it, you, you, you're. We should, we should also talk about how you're trying something new with your rule books and with your scenarios here too. This is a, like, this is really easy to take a look at these scenario cards, know how to set up the game just like that, and uh, like it's, there, you can get going really quickly when everything is laid out on a card like this. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. I'm trying to draw on, you know, what some of the best examples are out there. I mean, I don't know if it 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 catches the eye on this homemade version, but I'm, you know, very much inspired, as I mentioned, by Combat Commander and Combat Commander Pacific. So I try to mimic that style a little bit in terms of the scenario sheets. And the rule book for Coast Watchers, uh, on which I've gotten a lot of um, help and feedback already. It's very different from any other rule book I've done. I tried um, as best I could to absorb some of the um, creative ideas in uh, Jerry White's Atlantic Chase rule book. And, uh, you know, the Coast Watchers rule book isn't exactly like that, but you would, you, you'll recognize some of the stylistic choices. It has a lot of illustrations and examples uh, uh, and, and, I just trying to as much as I can get, I guess, get better at making the materials easy to learn and easy to use. If I can, well, it's um, it's 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 different. It's a totally different game than say coin games or the LNC games. But what I really appreciate, when, what I think you've done that is sort of similar to Jerry's rule book is look, is to go like, okay, this is this is an action you can do. Recruit. Uh, and here's the three things you need to do, and that's a recruit action. And it's very, it's like an action, what you do, and it's clean and, and really easy to understand. And and in the in the prototype rule book, it's it, it does. There's no, you're not overwhelmed by text in any way. It's like boom, boom, boom. There you've recruited, or there you've observed, or or whatever you've what you know whatever the action is. Yeah, I, I I hope so, and um, and I've actually been working to make it actually roomier in, in terms of the text, more you know, more white. I mean, it, it basically you end up on more pages that way, but uh, hopefully it's it's just easier to easier to take on the first time you go through because in most cases these huge word bricks staring at you. Um, it does not use the case system. Um, anyways, like I said, it's a very different style for me. I've had a lot of um, fun trying to learn uh, how to present in this way, and I've gotten a lot of help, so I'm pretty excited to to see how folks like it. it you say it's not the case system, but in a, in a way, those, those chunks that say, if you're going to do this, you do A, B, C, D, it does, it feels like the case system, but done in a really palatable way that, yeah. that, that makes it easy to digest. Well, that's the thing. Um, like most games, sequences are really important, right? The, the order in which you are allowed to do things, if to, to step through a procedure, you got to do A, then B, then C. That's really, really important to, uh, to, to game design. And it, it enables like any like procedures in professional life, for example, enables us to do rather complicated things 
because we're just doing one step at a time. Just do this, then you do this, then you do this. Well, so so that's absolutely there. And there's a lot of thought into the order in which you do things, um, both for uh, helping you get through a complicated process, but also because it has really important gameplay and simulation effects. I mean, the order in which the the Japanese player takes actions. If you want to go go to the um, play aids, you can maybe show those um, play aid references. But you'll see there the order in which the Japanese there's a turn sequence, of course. And if you go to uh, yeah, the Japanese activities, you'll see you do this, then you do this, then you do this. That makes a huge difference in terms of what you are and aren't able to do. And so. Yeah, it has. You know, we have to we have to present that order in the materials, in the rule book, and in the uh, the play aid materials. So A, B, C, one, two, three. You, see how, uh, you know how it's just like one, two, three, one, two, three. It's uh, it's like learning dance steps or something. It's uh, it's it's yeah, it could be. Yeah, could be. Hopefully, I mean, hopefully, each individual piece is you know is is quite easy to to to, to swallow, and then you move on to the next one. But in the rule book, we don't have the cross references. Aren't look up rule four point two point three. There are Jerry White style page cross references, but it's all just by pages. And uh, hopefully, that means that even though the the, the rule book is longer because there's more white space and lots of examples and illustrations, pictures, that kind of thing, um, when you're using it as a reference. And, and I found this was true with Atlantic Chase, it's still easy to use as a reference because, because if you're looking at a, you know, a chart and it was like, well, where's more information about what that word means? There's a rule, there's a page number right there that you can go to and read all about it if you need to. And in many cases, that page only has the rules for that one thing. And then the next page is a whole, is about something else it's not like right. the, the the page breaks that's that gives you more white space but it also is like if i'm looking at page seven uh, i'm looking at searches if i'm looking at page eight i'm looking at deploys or you know right. that sort of thing and uh, and most of the time when i'm able to manage it there's the the facing page is an example or maybe the next page when you flip is the example for that thing right uh it's not it's not Sure, it's not 100%, but that's the attempt. So if you look here, for example, uh, Japanese activities, countermeasures. Countermeasures is a phase during the turn during which you can do recall, search, or deploy. And that upper right, that little gray 15, right, that's the page in the rule book where, where, where it's more than one page explaining countermeasures, but that's where it begins. So if you have a question about that box, countermeasures start at page 15 in the, in the rule book. It's supposed to be, it's, it's homemade, you know, it's my home graphics, but I'm supposed to, it's kind of suggesting Coast Watcher binoculars, you know, that's the symbol. It's the, the for homemade graphics, like this, this map is looking pretty good. I, I think you've done a, a good job on your homemade graphics here, Volko. Thank you. I, I have a, a lot of uh, fun doing it and I have the, the time to do it. So I, I'm going to be staring at it for a long time before it goes to a professional artist. So I want it to be pleasant <laughs> to me. <laughs> Well, uh, should we should I, we go through a bit of this setup and then show? We can go. Through, yeah, yeah the we can we can uh, go through a little bit. So you're the allied player. So the first thing you would be doing is is secretly setting up your coast watchers. Obviously, as a Japanese player, I wouldn't be watching all this, but this is just right. for demonstration purposes. And uh, what uh, you and the other vassal module makers have worked out here is a kind of a a drop down uh, physically. It, you would just be changing out blocks, right? right? Physically, you'd have all these blocks there. Um, the production game board will have some recesses to hold those blocks, you know, in the right spot. And you would just ask, I'd be the Japanese player. You just asked me to, to look away for a bit or go get a beer or whatever. And you would be changing out these blocks one for one. You'd just be exchanging palm trees for Coast Watchers. Yeah, because um, these, these ones down here are... Are for the setup. they they need to be set up, and once they're out of that setup, yeah. They... So that's really just so in Vassal, it has to work a little differently. And those are, I think, just reminders of what you get. But yep. you're supposed to end up with basically that many. So these the little binoculars. That's a coast watcher, and the one with the the little rifles and canteen. That's a coast watcher with some gorillas, and those are all going to end up out on the map. 
And uh, by the setup, I think you end up with two of them in allied territory and the rest is all in Japanese territory, wherever you want them. Right. Well, I'll, I'll try and do that and we'll see how it goes here. Uh, and while you're doing that, I'm going to pour myself some sake since I'm Japanese here. Also, while you're doing that, I can talk a little bit about the, more about the situations. I mentioned there are 15 situations, and uh, there's a bit of programmed instruction built into them uh, as well. There's a, there's a training situation where you're just looking at one part of the map, the Solomon Islands, and you're just looking at the core functions of each side. The Coast Watcher is running their network and the Japanese hunting for them. And you're not worried about operations or refugees or rescues or anything like that. And that's a training scenario. So you get your kind of get down the, the core activity that you're doing each turn for both sides. And then the historical uh, situations from A to N, these 14 other situations, A is like a mini situation where the Japanese first come in, uh, where you learn other stuff that's going on, like rescues, for example. And then each situation is a, is a you know, its own game. But one thing I've done is if you play them in order or roughly in order, you get more and more say as you go in your setup at the beginning, especially regarding the cards. Because I've found that if you've got a, uh, a game where you've got like a whole deck of cards that you could purchase from, it's really hard to know what to do when you haven't played. You know, you don't really know what kinds of effects are important or what the card capabilities even really mean in context. And so I don't want to, I don't want to say, hey, here's 22 cards, pick which ones you want when you've never played. So the earlier situations deal you those cards randomly. And the further you go, the more and more choice you get to kind of build your strategy out of the assets deck, and in some cases out of the missions as well. And so you don't have to play them in order. You can, you know, if you bought the box, it's your game. You can <laughs> play it any want. But if you go more or less in order, it'll be easier because you won't be overwhelmed with this huge menu of, of, of choices right off the bat. Okay, so I've put my, I've replaced the, the, the blocks, and so there's there's nothing left in that uh, allied setup box anymore. I've put out, if it was the physical game, I would have just swapped out my Coast Watchers in for those, uh, uh, and swapped out the palm tree blocks, and away we'd go. It also says, uh, fill up the reports box, uh, and it tells how to do that. And But the, uh, the module's already done that. We've And perhaps I should mention what those are. Yeah. Um, so a as I uh, mentioned, one of the Coast Watchers important missions is to spy on these Japanese military buildups and report them uh, back to headquarters. And if the Coast Watching player does happen to successfully observe a Japanese buildup in one of these locations, there are markers for the, for the allied player to secretly switch out. And it basically records. So you don't have to take notes. It actually records what you've seen. And at the end of the game, you're gonna get points for that. But because they're face down markers in those reports boxes, the Japanese won't know that you've reported on them, right? They won't know what you know. So that's what those are. Right, it's, and it's a, another one of those little uh, uh, secret information things. Like it's actually a, a, a sort of a fourth, uh, a fourth little secret information mechanic you've got going on here because you know what you know, but the other player doesn't know what you know. That's right. Uh, so that's what those are. Nothing to do there. The VASPA module has already set it up for us. And by the way, all those markers right now are just palm trees, which is nothing to report. So an intelligence term, NTR, nothing to report, nothing happening yet, right? right? That's all they are. So it's really just putting a blank, in effect, a blank marker in each of those little boxes. And then what we haven't shown yet, uh, the uh, well, we'll have to do, um, I'm going to get some missions. And uh, the, I think those have already been dealt to me. Yeah, uh, so the Vassal module uh, actually does that work for you. Uh, in the setup, in the physical game, there's little instructions. You get rid of these cards and randomly draw a couple of those. But here, the uh, green cards have already been dealt to you, so you can look at what you've got. Uh, these, are, these are kind of, you know, we already know the Coast Watcher's main mission. The Coast Watcher's main mission is to report on Japanese buildups and warn of um, Japanese operations. 
but there are other things that they need to that they might be tasked with doing and that's what these green cards represent and can I flip one over? Is that uh... yeah? Flip. Go ahead and flip them all over. I, I I won't take advantage of you. I won't cheat. We'll just but for demo purposes, here's what the Allied player would looking because you were going to need to know that anyway. Right. So uh, it's sort of things you might think of, right? Uh, so right now I'm seeing the only the escape. Here we go. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So we, we have a, an extraction mission, a network development mission, an escape mission. That's uh, to uh, that's refugees, right? That's uh, what you talked about earlier about uh, getting people off of the islands that were that are trying to uh, that want off an off of an island. That's uh, you described that in uh, real life. Uh Right, exactly. So, uh, so these none of these are likely to be decisive, but to the game, but they're kind of extra things that are more or less that are more important than they otherwise would be. Um, that is hidden now from the Japanese, right? The Japanese don't know about these, and the one that we have to deal with right away is escape, which is to say, there are some refugees somewhere that that need your help to get them out. Show immediately. So, show in the game just means. You're, you're you're revealing the card. So as soon as you drew these, you would basically take put them out on the board. You put it face up. The Japanese are going to know that there's refugees out there somewhere, but they're not going to know where. So scatter. See where it says scatter one refugees. So we're going to have to go through a scatter routine because you don't refugees are. That's that just happens to you. Right. And so scatter. This is only at the beginning of the game. This only happens during setup, by the way. Um, so, so it's a one-time thing. It means we're going to have to see where these folks are. And so in Vassal, we have this scatter deck. You see they're the allied asset cards. The allied asset cards just have this second function only at the beginning, only during setup. In this case, it's going to be only once, that they have a little random place uh, in the bottom corner. So basically, we want to randomly draw one of these cards and put our refugees there. So in the bottom left, Guadalcanal in gray is the region. That's several spaces. Lavoro is the space. And so you're going to put a refugee at Lavoro. That's here. <laughs> well, there wasn't uh, the what is the little pop up. I'll have to tell Will. Uh, it said to he, he forgot to put the uh, the refugee in the setup area, but that's all right. Yeah. So again, physically, you would just be changing these blocks out while yeah. the Japanese players not looking. So what difference do these refugees make? So if the Japanese find them and take them, the Japanese are going to score points, and uh, the Coast Watchers want to avoid that. If the Coast Watchers rec rescue them, they'll get I think a victory point for that. So it's kind of like a a, a side mission that's there. You can choose to ignore it if you want, but there they are. There's some folks at Lavora who are asking to evacuate from Guadalcanal. So it's a, like a, a little bit of extra, a little bit of extra victory points uh, that that could be decisive in a close game, right. I suppose. And since the Japanese player has seen the card, because you had to show it immediately, seen that mission card, the Japanese know these refugees are out there somewhere. Right. So the the, the Japanese player has seen the mission card, but not the scatter card. They, they know the mission, but they don't know where they are. Exactly. That's a good question. I, I had to set out my uh, Coast Watchers before we did the scatter. So mm -hmm. I had to put the Coast Watchers out before I knew where those refugees were going to be. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it could have happened that those refugees are right at an active station, whether you already have a coast watcher. So we have a little block that has a coast watcher and a refugee together. Right. And that's that's lucky for you. They're already there and able to rescue them. But right now there's nobody in the area to rescue them. So you'll have to insert a coast. If you want to go help those refugees, you're going to have to insert a coast watcher from Australia. Right. To go Into get one them. Of these, one of these closer uh, places. Uh. Right, or, to Lavoro or, itself. Um, yeah, or if yeah. they're close by, they can retrieve them. Yes, either either yes. way. Yeah, and so that's why you have two Coast Watchers in ready. If you look at the upper left of your screen. Up here. There are actually, these are, this, these are Coast Watching teams that are already trained. They're in Australia, 
Brownsville, or maybe they're in Port Moresby. Anyway, they're ready, but you'd have to deliver them to a station and get them set up. Train more of those if you want, because you'll have a, a better network, a better ability to do those missions, but you also get points, a few points, half a point each as the, as the allies, just for having a network in place in Japanese territory, because this scenario only covers a couple months. Of course, when that time is over, you still want to have Coast Watchers up. That's why you have right. this ready box of, of additional Coast Watcher blocks. Right. These, and we, I would use like this, this is the allied player aid. I would use this uh, action to get them to where I want them to go. Exactly right. Okay, well, let's uh, see what else we need to set up here before we go. Um, I think in terms of the allies, I think everything's done because I believe the, the, the cards are all... I think all that stuff is done, isn't it? So all that stuff gets done automatically by the vast module. Let's have a look right. and see what you've gotten. Talk about allied asset cards. Okay. You might need a little more room on that screen to spread them out. Let's. So the asset cards in the game, the blue for the allies, these are just other little goodies to help you um, during the course of play. And you can, you have to show them to use them and you can show them basically whenever you want um, you or as specified on the card. So we have, uh, I think there's probably one underneath boats still, if I'm not mistaken. There is, yeah. Well, there it is, Catalina. Catalina, right, and uh, something else is underneath it. Okay, so let's talk about boats and Catalina because these are really common. So if they have that uh, white box on them with the delivery cup image there, that little icon, these this is what you use for kind of half of the actions that you're going to be taking as a Coast Watchers, which has to do with deliveries to the stations or from the stations. So if you want to insert a Coast Watcher or rescue refugee or very commonly resupply your Coast Watchers, um, you're going to be, you have to have some, some vehicles, if you will, to get them there. And that's what these are. You're going to use those to conduct those deliveries. And uh, uh, the little white box with the, uh, the delivery cup, that's just some instructions to how that's going to be resolved. By the way, there are no dice in this game. The, uh, the randomness card deal comes from just uh, pulling chits from two cups. The delivery cup for the the allies, and the uh, the patrol cup for the Japanese. So we'll hit hit those at a time. But anyway, so that's what those two are: the boats and the Catalina. These are workhorses of the the Coast Watchers to basically do the transportation to and from these stations in enemy held territory. Then we've got some other special things: two copies of spies. So this is the the spy networks. The uh, the the and their indigenous teams were really ama amazingly effective at infiltrating Japanese facilities. So this particular scenario, uh, the airfield, uh, June, July, 42, you know, there's the famous Japanese airfield that they're building on Guadalcanal that, that spurred the allies to invade the island, Operation Watchtower, uh, take over that airfield, complete it, name it Henderson Field, the Battle of Guadalcanal is on. So that airfield, the, uh, the, 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 the Coast Watchers were all over it not only observing what the Japanese are doing, uh, constructing uh, the, the, the airfield, but the Japanese would recruit local workers, you know, indigenous laborers, if you will. And among those indigenous laborers are, are spies working with the Allied Coast Watchers. And so there's, there's a lot of detail that we're getting on the progress of this, this airfield. Um, uh, you know, before the Japanese have ever completed it, that leads to that that watchtower operation. So, so really, uh, you know, work from an intelligence point of view. And here, you've uh, happened to pick two of these cards that allow you to more effectively spy on Japanese activities, which is you know quite fitting for this particular situation. 
Uh, code breaking, which is the, the, the famous uh, ability to, to read uh, Japanese radio codes. And that's going to allow the allied player in this case to see what all the Japanese missions are. The Japanese are going to have their own secret missions, but they're not going to be secret in this case because, <laughs> because in this case, that they've been read with code breaking. And, and these then finally, you see the, randomly, right? The, like the, yep. every time you play this scenario, these six cards could be, well, the four, the, you're always going to get the boats and the Catalina, but the other four are random. Right. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. And no. So if you look at, if you go right. back to the situation information uh, and you look at one of those Intel brief uh, cards uh, in, in uh, the intelligence, uh, the middle tab, there you go. See at the bottom. So yeah. you're always going to have, you're always going to, the allies are always in this scenario, in this situation, going to draw boats and Catalinas. They're right. going to have two out of four of these particular cards that are useful for the main mission they're facing in this scenario, which is to find that air base being built in the, right. in the in Solomons. Case, we, got the, the, we got the spies twice, so we didn't. Yeah, so you happen to get out of those six possibilities, you pick the two spy cards randomly. Right. You might play this again and not have any spies. You might have right. some of the other ones. And then that are suitable to this period of time because there are a number of assets that don't make sense for 1942. Those are called 1943 cards. In other words, the point is every situation has some historical parameters, right? That where it's trying to make sense. The Japanese don't know exactly what you're going to pick, but you're more likely to have this than that. And you're always going to have some the Catalina, for example. Right. Uh, uh okay. So, what, so, which also gives uh, each scenario uh, a giant chunk of replayability. Yes, I, I hope so, um, because there, that's going to be true not just for the Allied assets, but as you can see, for the Japanese assets and for the missions on both sides. And if you get tired of one of the situations, there are fourteen others and four campaigns. So, yeah. you know, probably you're going to get you're going to get well tired of the whole thing before you get through all the situations in the box. <laughs> Most likely. Well, who knows? I guess By we'll the way, Reed out. and Mason. Yeah, we'll find out. The so Reed and Mason, the uh, that those two fellows there, those are the ones I was talking about on Bougainville right. who were giving that that really pivotal air uh, air raid warning to Guadalcanal. Those are the guys. And they survived the war? They did survive the war, yeah. As I said, they were under heavy pressure. They were evacuated finally by submarine, and they returned to Bougainville as part of Operation Cherry Blossom. So they got kicked out of there by the Japanese, you know, and they really hated that, but they were back just a few weeks later with the U.S. Marines. Right. All right, back to uh, the setup. I think there's a couple of things that we need to do for the uh, Japanese player. Indeed. Yes. You, I guess we can we can look at your cards because yeah. So the Japanese have also picked missions and assets, and again the the computer uh, the Vassal program has done that for us. So let's go ahead and spread out the Jap all the Japanese cards and see what we have. Well, I guess maybe just got one of those. There we go. Okay. So, so let's talk about the pink cards first, the mission cards. So this is the particular combination of um, special victory points, if you will, uh, uh, obtainable by the Japanese. And the one on the left there, the bombing, you can see 15 victory points per target. And, and if you looked at the details, it would work out that there's a possibility actually of having two targets being hit. So that's a whopping 30 victory points if this bombing mission is launched. The uh, the the twist on that is that if the, if the Japanese player, if I were in this game to launch that operation, it means that you're going to score, the Coast Watchers are going to score warning points for all the Coast Watchers along the way. So um, probably I'm going to want to carry out this bombing, but I probably don't want to rely on it to, to win the game because it's, it could end up being actually a, a, a fairly small number of points, theoretically even negative points if you're 
if I hit a um, lot of coastal. How many points does the Allied get, player get? Per, like, if if the German or sorry, the uh, Japanese is thirty points for the bom for the two bombings. How many points are off? How many points does the Allied player get per mm. coast watcher to offset that? Right. So the the that bombing mission is going to have to draw a path. This is where the bombers are flying, right from right. Rabaul and Kaviang in the in the north of the map to the allied bases, which are uh, Port Moresby. In fact, I think in this scenario, there's only one allied base. So it's actually only gonna be 15 because the allies aren't, <laughs> the, the Americans aren't here yet. It's just Port Moresby. So the most I can hit is one. So it's gonna be 15 points, but I've got to fly from Rabal and Kaviang to Port Moresby. So notice I can do all that without touching the Solomon Islands and you don't know that. So this is a reason why you're gonna to have to think about also building up your Coast Watcher network in New Guinea and in Britain while you're also looking for that airfield somewhere in the Solomons that you think I'm building in the Solomons. And when and, you say your, your flight path has to go, you're talking about like going along these. Uh, exactly. These, uh, exactly. Kind of pale purple I'm gonna, lines. I'm going to have to connect up Rabal and Kaviang, those two Japanese bases on the right side of the board with Port yeah. Moresby, that dark blue space at the top left. Right. Those, and so those, along those that line, every coast watcher that you have along that line is going to score either um, three or two points each. If you're more than two spaces away from Port Moresby, that's distant warning. You're going to score three points for every coast watcher. If it's closer to Port Moresby within two spaces, that's two points. And then every coast watcher adjacent to that path scores another point. Because it's just re it's redundant coverage, and you know the planes might go a little bit this way, a little bit that way, right? Right. Uh, so that's potentially if you had a lot of coast watchers in in New Guinea and New Britain, that's potentially a lot of points. You could actually score more than fifteen theoretically, right? In which case, it would have been a bad thing for me to launch that operation. Uh, so knowing that that's going to be a place where you're going to be searching for my coast watchers probably as well. Yes, but if I, wherever I search, if I'm beating the bushes somewhere, you're going to know, right? right? You see my patrols. They're going to be out there, and I'm going to be announcing these searches. And if I'm spending a lot of an inordinate amount of attention searching for guys in uh, in New Britain, that might be a clue to you what's coming, right? <laughs> so right. now, you know, and that's not my only mission either. So I've got these other ones. Uh, and uh, appropriate enough, I got one called airstrip grading on the right. Uh, can, one, can, this is this is the airstrip that becomes Henderson Field. Right, this is Henderson Field, right. And there's a particular twist here that's a challenge for the Japanese in just this one situation. But if you look at that card again, it's build up turn one. And if you read the fine print, you only get, it's 15 victory points. It's really important. It's big. I only get those points, though, if I place it right away in the beginning and you don't report on it, I have to keep that thing a secret uh, for the, for the, you know, for the duration of this scenario to score those points. And you have some inkling from that intelligence brief that I'm trying to build an airstrip somewhere in the Solomons, maybe two. I drew one of them as it happened. So that's unique to this situation. And it's just reflecting the particular importance of that uh, that construction project on Guadalcanal, and do you reveal this card if you're successful, af like after turn one, because it has to happen in turn one. Uh, so turn one, I'm going to place the buildup, but I have to be successful the rest of the game. So I'm hoping you don't find it. Ah, right. And unfortunately for me, I don't know this, but you have two car spies that are very helpful in scouring the area and reporting, which is what happened historically. I mean, historically, the Japanese did not succeed in hiding this from the Coast Watcher spies. So that's so I might decide, forget it. I'm never going to, I'm just going to go with the bombing operation. Or I might decide, forget the bombing operation. I'm going to try to do the airstrip grading. Or I might try to do both. And each of those re re require different buildups. There are very few Japanese buildup actions. As you can see, bombing requires aircraft buildups. Airstrip grading requires construction on Guadalcanal. These are right. each different actions that I can choose between. And then on top of that, I've got some other base building I can do for some points, up to 20 points if I build bases throughout uh, the, 
the, the northern part of the islands. And finally, I've got this special one, security. security. This one, if I have this, I'm going to score even more points if I catch you. If I actually succeed, it's hard to do. But if I succeed and, and capture some Coast Watchers, I'm going to get a lot of added points for that. Or right. at least just clearing out, deactivating a station that I know for sure there's nobody there on that island. So, and you don't know that I have that. Well, actually, I yes, will. you do. Because I have five cards. Right. So that's another problem for me as the Japanese is these are nice little secrets to keep, but you're going to see these four pink cards because right. of color. So you're going to know what you're looking for and what my choices are. I saw some choices. I, I think I had two spy cards. So that, in a way, I only really need one. So one, let's have a look at them. Yeah. And I'll tell you, why is it, why, why two? So first of all, these are limited to one action per phase, one observe action per phase. Then you've used that card. You kind of like, let's say, tap it to show you've used it if you want. Well, you're, you can do more than one. You can have five actions per phase. So you could do two different observe actions and both could be right. spies. That's number one. Number two, right. that orange word in the, in the text of spies, see that orange word take at the bottom. Take means the Japanese are captured your Coast Watcher. Okay. If instead you suffer, a, you can be taken trying to observe. You can be taken while you're spying. Right. While you're while you're observing this coast watcher, if you're taken, you don't lose your coast watcher. You just lose the card, because it's not the coast watcher who's taken. It's the unfortunate spy, the 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 ad, the agent, right? So maybe one of your spy cards gets taken. That's okay. You've got a second one, right? And it's the and it's actually the code breaking card that lets me see what your missions are, not the spy cards, right? Yeah, exactly. So you see that there's a there's a lot going on here. And one thing I should say is that this. Obviously, this is not the finished product, right? This is a prototype. So we've been doing some testing. I've been working on this for some months with, with some good folks uh, like you. And I think the core engine that runs the game is tuned quite well. You know, the, the kind of like how the Coast Watchers do their thing and the Japanese are searching for them and that kind of balance. I feel like that engine is running smoothly. It's the, the, the main activity, the main engine that drives the game forward. But a so lot of these things, yeah, the actions like observe and search and deliver, insert, rescue, all that stuff. I feel like that's running smoothly now. And that took a while to, to, to tune, right? It, it didn't start out working well <laughs> at all, right? But I think it's working well now. So that's good news. But we've got a lot of other knobs to tune on the radio before this thing is completely running right. And especially, and this is going to take, I think, a lot of testing if you think about across 15 situations and four campaigns. Those victory point values I showed you, you know, 15 for this or six for that, right? four for this, three for that. Yeah, you know, I mean, these are kind of my guess right. is what, but I've got, I can't predict enough. You threw these, some victory point numbers against the wall and we're going to test it and see. And, and Right. And we've got, and we've already been testing and tinkering with that, but we're going to, there's going to be a lot of testing yet to be done before we go to print. Um, uh, th th to to turn those numbers, you know, so that fifteen on that card might be a twelve or might be an eighteen. I just don't know yet. Right, right, right. But the good news on that is it's pretty easy to change. It's it's if you've got core rules, core actions, and you change something, there's like all these ripple effects in the design, right? But if it's just a peripheral, like this card is worth ten or this card is worth fifteen, I just change two numbers in the file. It's very easy. And it's unlikely to upset the harmony that has been established in the center of the game. Right. Because the, like you said, the mechanics are working. It's, it's, it's tuning the, the balance and the victory yep. point. The values, the balance of the victory points. Right. Is, is, so that's, so there's that, there's making sure that the materials are clear, that everything's specified, you know, uh, that kind of thing that that's still ahead of us, but probably the biggest test project is what should those numbers be? Those victory point values. Well, that whole clarity thing, that's how I got to, that's how I came into your, this project as it was. I, I didn't right. come in to, to work on the Vassal module. Like I came in because Will and I, in a, one of the podcasts, we were talking about how much he loves uh, Levy and campaign games, but he gets frustrated sometimes at the rule books and yeah. he called his bluff and said, 
well, Will and Grant, why don't you come and <laughs> yeah. the rule right? Books? Well, because it was a it was a great discussion, and I I really enjoyed it and appreciated listening to it. But it's also you know um, you know that got to me in a bit because I mean you guys are you know you guys are my audience here. So if if the uh, if if Levy and Campaign is a you know has merit in the design, but the way that the rule book is done stands in the way, I really want to get better. You know, I want to learn and and do a, do better. So this is a, a lot of experimentation in Coast Watchers to try. To well, we should that. we should also say uh, the, we had quibbles. It wasn't like we felt like the, yeah. the rule book was getting in the way, but it was like the, this three percent could have been better. That it was. Yeah. That sort of well. Thing. Uh, yeah, and, but they're sensible points, and and it, it it's a you know it's a it's grit in the engine, you know. Right. And right. if we if we can, you know, it's worth a lot to me if we can clean that out. Well, and it's, it's, you know, like we've talked a, a lot uh, tonight about how you've done, taken a completely different approach to rulebook writing on this game. I, I'm not sure that the, the, the approach of rulebook writing that you're using here would work uh, for a levy and campaign. Uh, you know, it, it might make for a really huge book. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, uh, that, that may be. I do think there's some, there's less picky and intricacy, let's say, to this. Um, uh, game system than that so yeah. so you yeah, may yeah. well be right there's a, there's still tons going on but the there's not uh tiny things like or well, i shouldn't say tiny big things like understanding taifa politics or like there's there's whole layers in in the different uh, lnc games that you really got to wrap your head around for sure yeah yeah all right back to this game we haven't okay. finished actually quite setting up uh, so there's a little bit of really stuff quick, for you yeah here. all right so let's look quickly at uh um so so for example here japanese set assets if you were doing this physically you'd have a deck of japanese asset cards you'd get rid of all the 1943 cards there's three of them you draw ishimoto and construction battalions every time for this situation you're going to have those two the allies are going to know you have those two and then you're going to get two others out of 17 that you draw so let's see what we got for the japanese asset cards. So there's Ishimoto. Ishimoto, by the way, is a guy who uh, lived uh, in the Guadalcanal Tulagi area before the war. Uh, and he returned there with the Japanese forces uh, during the, the Coral Sea operation. And he ended up searching as a kind of searching for the uh, Coast Watchers as a kind of a, you know, he was a sort of a, I don't know if he was a, a counterintelligence official as such, or mainly a liaison for the Japanese with the indigenous people, and he was basically scouring the area, asking questions about the Coast Watchers and, and chasing after them. So he helps you in this game uh, get local support as the Japanese. You can do a search every every turn in which your army patrol acts as if it's police. You're getting local help via Ishimoto. That's what right. That and is. as you said earlier, the police work much more effectively than the army does because they are the indigenous population. Exactly right. So that's what he does does for you. So he's going to help me as the Japanese player protect that Guadalcanal airfield construction project from your spying because he's going to help me patrol and search for for uh, um, for for you. Uh, then uh, on the right, oh, it's construction talent is the other one. This just helps me build up faster, uh, which is really useful here since I I am going to be building that airfield. And then uh, I should have. Should have gotten two others. Oh, is there? I should have got right. Wasn't it two more? I think so. Are is there anything stacked there, or did did we not achieve the? Did the programming not work? I'm curious. Ooh. Let's see what we were supposed to get. Maybe the maybe the. I may have to go in and and, and fix that. But yeah, go back to the Japanese. Are there any? Are those any of those cards stacked? No, huh? No, they don't seem to be. So huh. it looks like we just, uh, we, we, uh, in our well, setup. To... There we go. Play tested. I'll have to make a note about that. <laughs> this is uh situation D vassal Japanese asset card deal. Okay. So, uh, let's look at Tanaka though, before we leave, um, some of the, some of these assets really have to do, especially on the Japanese side, specifically with Japanese military operations, um, in a way that they intersect with um, 
in a way that they intersect with the Coast Watchers. So Tanaka was a Japanese admiral who basically organized what became known to the Allies as the Tokyo Express. And the, the special thing about the Tokyo Express was it was trying to avoid Allied air power, especially by the timing of these runs of destroyers delivering supplies and men to Guadalcanal. They would leave uh, the vicinity of Bougainville near, near Bowen, Shortland's uh, anchorage. They'd run down the slot, the channel between the islands, and they would basically time these so that just as they're coming into Allied airstrike range, it's nightfall. And so the Allies can't hit them because it's nighttime with air. They'd race these destroyers to the island. They'd unload their stuff really quickly. And then they'd boogie back out so that by the time the sun came up again, they're back out of Allied air range. Okay. So think about that. So this Tanaka was the main guy who worked that system out that was, that was successful in avoiding, you know, avoiding Allied air power. Anyway, Think about that in terms of this tactical warning that the that the Allied Coast Watchers are going to provide. I can warn you that the that the um, uh, Tokyo Express is coming, but so what if you can't do anything about it? Because Tanaka has organized that trip in such a way that your air power is neutralized anyway. It's less effective, and so what Tanaka is doing for me here is if I launch an operation. It, it could be like the Tokyo Express in another scenario. It doesn't exist yet. But if I launch an operation that involves ships, you're not going to get to score for the fact that you've got coast watchers within close range of that target because it's nighttime and it, you're not going to do anything about it, right? It reduces the score available to you. So it makes my warship operations attractive as the Japanese player. Now, unfortunately for me, I didn't happen to pick any. So Tanaka is just not going to help me right now. And you're going to know that because you know what my, what my missions are. And right. And that's a, the, the combination of Tanaka. You need a different um, pink cards to make Tanaka a, a valuable uh, asset. Right. Me, so let's see if there are any in this scenario. I don't remember. But if you go back to that Intel brief, you could have seen what I might have drawn. And maybe there is, or maybe Tanaka is just not useful here. Uh, aerial recon improvements. Uh, yeah. So there's a landing. So there's a there's a 50% chance here if, at the upper right that I would have had this 20 victory points for um, delivering to Buna. These are the, these are the forces that are going to fight the Kokoda Trail campaign. Their initial landing that's happening now. That's twenty victory points. Tanaka would make it really hard. Well, it would make it harder for you to score warning points against that twenty if I drawn it. Right. So bad news for me that didn't match up. The good news is I can draw more assets. So one of the j actions the Japanese get is they can draw on more. The Coast Watchers are running a little bit leaner operation. <laughs> they don't have this ability, but I am to some degree playing the, the Imperial Japanese Navy and Army here. And so I can also use my time rather than building up for these missions. I can use those actions instead to augment my assets to counter you, to draw more of those Japanese asset cards to use if I want to. It's just an option in the game. All right. So then we have left the patrols. Right. So you can see there ready six patrols. These are basically patrols that are ready to be sent out into the bush to hunt coast watchers. That's that stack in the yellow ready box to the right of where you're showing. Yeah, those guys are, right there. Are ready guys, but you right. still get to set up these guys. But right? I also get some guys that are already out there. So let's, let's have a look. Uh, I think it's, how many is it? It's all right. Two, two armies. So at the lower right place on map, two police are a ball and caviang. So my main right. bases, I've got some effective local patrols yeah. already they're protecting already them. There, right? They're already out there because there's no choice. But these guys I could put anywhere just to kind of start me off at looking for you. Now, of course, if I'm the Japanese player playing this for real, I don't see, all I see is blanks. I have no idea where you are. Yeah, you don't see all the, the all these C's are just blank. You're seeing the back sides of the blocks. I'm just seeing blanks. But I know a couple of things. I know what my mission is. 
supposed to build an airfield. I know where I might send a bombing run. And I also know that somewhere out there, you've got refugees. So I've got things to think about in terms of where to put these first guys, right? And, you know, I might say, well, I'm going to try to get away with, I don't know that you've got all those spies. I don't know. You probably wouldn't have shown me code breaking yet. You'd wait for me to right. set up my, yeah, you know, sure. my patrols, right? So I don't know any of that. So I'd pretend. So I might say, you know what? I'm going to try to, well, so here's a question. I could say, I'm going to try to build that airfield on Guadalcanal. I'm going to protect it with these patrols. If I right away put both my patrols in the Guadalcanal region, that's going to be a big signal to you. Maybe I'd do that. Maybe I wouldn't, right? So I, I don't know. So maybe I just do one. Let's say I put one of them at Lunga Tulagi. That's where they originally did build that airfield. There you go. But let's say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hedge my bets because uh, I do the bombing run and I'm going to want to clear uh, I'm going to want to clear New Guinea. And I've also got, I, do I have the Gazmata construction? Let's put them at Gazmata. Gaz yeah, in that, exactly there. there. Where they're, that, you got it. Yeah, yeah, it's in the New Britain area. Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of, first of all, it's not telling you as much about what I'm interested in and it kind of hedges my bets if I wanted to launch that bombing rate. So it's only two patrols. It's not a big decision. But, you know, it matters some. It's an opportunity for me to signal. I could try to, you know, throw you off if I really right. had already you decided. Could, you could deception here to, to, to try and put me the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah, sure. exactly. So let's say I decided I'm just going to try to, I'm going to go for the airfield here. Um, I'm not going to give you a chance to have any warning. Then I've kind of put that guy in Gazmata to mislead you. On the other hand, if it's the opposite, I'm, I'm going to give up on the airfield. I'm just going to do the bombing. Then I've done the same with the guy who's on Guadalcanal. The other thing in the Japanese setup box there, patrol cup, uh, right. evasion of patrol. This is the uh, what I mentioned, the way that searches are resolved. We're going to be pulling these chits out. And it starts out with a certain mix of, I did spot you, I didn't spot you, right, in there. That just starts out depending on how um, close the Japanese are on the heels of the Coast Watchers at this this point in time. And, yeah, the, and these are and the setup of the game has has already done that. Like the, the module has done that for us, but right. in the game you'd put us like eight chicks, eight of one kind of chit and four of another kind of chit or whatever, whatever it says the, the mix is in the cup, right? Exactly. And that mix is just going to go up and down depending on what kind of missions we're doing and how the searching is going. Um, so it, it represents what we are talking about, how, you know, how tight is the new around the coast watches how close are the japanese on their heels you know have they eliminated certain parts of the island as being cleared of coast watchers and zeroing in on the coast watcher hideouts or are they nowhere close by so that's kind of represented by that cup in a somewhat abstract way and then yeah that uh that's sort of a shared so that has the turn sequence and the victory points at the top at the bottom you can see there's just the step by step how do you resolve those those two cup draws, which you're going to be doing a lot because they're kind of your dice rolls of the game, if you will. Right. But using the cups, I was able to, um, you know, make the probab manipulate the probability a little bit to represent things like how tight is the Japanese cordon around the Coast Watchers? How much on the run are they? That's represented by the mix of those chits in the cup that the players can influence. And that's just a lot easier to do with chits in a cup than various fancy dice or whatever right drms um, or whatever you're going to do uh, to change things yeah exactly it's just shown by what's in the, what's in the cup and similarly for allied uh delivery um you know it, it's easier for a submarine to get in or out than a catalina uh right and so those and the japanese i didn't have any this time but the japanese have various assets um that can patrol and look for these delivery, look for the boats and the Catalina and submarines and whatnot. And that's going to influence the mix of chits in the delivery cup. That might mean it's quite dangerous for you to try to insert a coast watcher or rescue refugees or quite safe. Right. Uh, right. right. That's depends on how many chits are going in the cup. The box to the upper left here, this is this, that's the turn sequence. And correct. It's, a, it's, it's like uh, we talked about earlier. It's like, this, 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 this is, you know, you, you, 
if you're doing activities, you go and have a look at, see what your activities are. Or if you're, if you're doing countermeasures, you go and look at what the Japanese countermeasures are. It's, it's really straightforward in terms of, if you want to teach yourself this game, you can really just go by these charts and, and it'll, and they'll step you through exactly what you need to do. And so we can look at every turn. And again, uh, most of the situations are maximum three turns long. And if the Japanese launch an operation on turn two, it's two turns long. Some right. of the situations could go as long as five turns, right? So it's a fairly short game. And I will say, I don't know how, I don't know yet what, I don't have the data to say what the play time will be on average, but I will say that I have never sat down to a face-to-face -face, um, test of Coast Watchers and not finished the game in that session, including the discussion and everything. So I think it's going to be quite, uh, quite doable. To, right. to 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 play it quickly and so Easily in each game yeah and so what you see on that turn sequence is in the beginning japanese preparations this is when the japanese will play their buildups or they can send they can uh ready more patrols to be sent to the field the ready box or they can augment is draw cards uh they can get themselves some more asset cards so that's the beginning and then it's going to be allied activities japanese countermeasures allied activities japanese countermeasures and that's the turn so the Allies are going to get their five actions. The Japanese get five actions to hunt the, the Coast Watchers. Allies five, Japanese five, over next turn. So that's that's it. And then the the uh, the little kicker on that, step five there, is if, if the Japanese do launch an operation that turn, they give up their final countermeasures, right? They're just doing their operation, and that ends the game. And that ends the game. You, they give up their, their final countermeasures. They launch the thing, and... We see how we it rack goes up the points and rack up the points, right? That's it, and that's a and that the operation is that's launching the operation is always a choice by the Japanese player. There's nothing that triggers those. It's like correct each, each time. It's in your player, yeah, it. it's in your hands as the Japanese player. You can do no operations at all, uh, or, or you can choose among several if you have them. And if you have enough that you can provide separate buildups for all of them, you can do multiple operations. There's right, one right. exception to that in the entire game, and that is the situation that represents Operation Watchtower. And in that situation, it's it's basically the emergency situation that the Americans have just landed on Guadalcanal. And so the Japanese um, command at Rabaul is very much focused on hitting the Americans while they're still unloading on the beaches, right? Uh, because this is, this is a really big deal. And the first time that the Japanese really have to deal with a, um, an American offensive, uh, an allied offensive for that matter, really. So in that one situation out of the, the 15, there's a requirement that the Japanese player must launch at least one operation to the Guadalcanal region. Um, and there are several to, to, to choose from. It might be a, a night surface engagement. It might be a torpedo run. It might be bombing Henderson, whatever. But you do have to launch one or you lose. But that's the only um, situation. It's the only scenario in the game where there's any requirement to launch an operation. So you it's can a, a unique case. So another another way you can end the game is just after five turns. If the Japanese hasn't launched an operation, then you you just you score up the point. points. Yep, you score up the points. And the Japanese are getting points for other kinds of missions that aren't operations, as we saw, like for building airfields, for example. Right. They so also they get still, missions for, for taking coast watchers. Right, right, exactly. Right. They might they might just focus on just the security part for the counterintelligence right. part. They might just focus <laughs> they could round up the allies and, and win that way. Exactly. Exactly. And okay. that's kind of an attractive possibility in this particular draw because I got the security mission, which means I get lots of bonus points for if I do succeed in capturing any Coast Watchers. So to start, uh, you you do this step one here, which is right. uh, you can do two. Uh, it's probably buildups, but you can also ready for the patrols or augment the assets. Augment assets, that must mean drawing more of those... Uh, uh, yellow or pink card or yellow cards. The yellow cards, the Japanese assets. Yeah, That's yeah. exactly right. right. So I would have uh, two preparation actions now. This is my only time during the turn where I add those buildups that I need to achieve missions. And so right away, I've got a 
strategic decision of, um, you know, am I going to, am I going to try to get away with building that airfield? I have to place it this turn to score by just by the special unique nature of the mission in this, right. That uh, one mission. Did that one mission in this scenario. Um, so that would be happening now. And I don't know what I would decide. It's hard for me to, <laughs> cause I do know right, because, kind of what you got, because, right? That's right. Because at this point we'd, uh, we've, we're done the setup and uh -huh. I would have played that uh, code breaking card. Maybe. Are you required to? Let's see. Well. Let's have a look. Yeah. Timing matters. Okay. Show at any time. So, you know, you haven't had to make any big decisions yet. You might want to hold on to that. Let me commit my preparations. Right. And, and then play code break, breaking later, you know, to right. kind of wrong foot me then. So probably it would have made sense for you to hold on to that for now. Because you can yeah. always, whenever you want it, you can you can play it. No, that's that's uh, that sounds exactly the way to do it. Is wait till you commit a little more and then have a look. So I'm thinking I might, since I've got the army patrol at Gazmata there on New Britain at the center of the map. I think I have a, some victory points that I can score. That's kind of like out of the way, and it's now covered by a patrol. I have some victory points I could score just by doing construction there. I think I might, one of my buildups, I might commit to that. And so, so, so that's going to, should probably, yeah, Japanese only uh, replace with construction. So go ahead and do that. So, so it's not showing up because you're not allowed to see it. You're looking at the allied screen, right. but if you did a peek there, if you go there and do peek, you should be able to spot that, which is what you would do, right? right if you were observing there. And if you did that secretly, I I can't I wouldn't see you see it, and I don't see you're looking. Right. At it. It's the vast. I'll, I'll just show it, uh, another one because this is what they normally look like is when there's nothing. Palm trees. Is is just palm trees like that. Yeah. So let's go back to the the Japanese window, and I'll show you why I put that construction at Gazmata. So I've got that uh, base building, that third pink card uh construction at and bp i'm just making a note here i can see how i can improve this yeah this is any uh, the for the folks that are watching this is you're getting to see uh, how the sausage gets made here yeah we're making some sausage here. yeah i just noticed that i don't have on here the um the regions in gray to help you find these spaces. And I think I could give a little, I've got the room on that card to give a little more guidance on where these places are by giving right. the region this, names. Right. Because this, a lot of these region names are going to be um, not totally familiar to people. People might know right. the Solomons, but they might not know each of these little stations in the Solomons or. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I totally appreciate that. I'm, I'm playing a world war one game uh, right now uh, where uh, they just tell you place a place an army in and it, uh, sometimes right like, Where is yeah. It? yeah and so what i've done is i've i've um because i don't have hex numbers here to give you right it's just a point to point map but on the map i've just divided it up with these white lines into these different regions like bougainville right. or guadalcanal and so the gray text is like a cue that it's one of those so that you can at least get into the right part of the map as you hunt for these right. little station right. names. Anyway, so if you go back to that Japanese player window and that base building card, there are four, the green is the station spaces, right? Gazmata, right. Finchhoff, and Salamo, Abuka. Every construction buildup I do at one of those places, I'm gonna get five victory points. Right. And if you find it, by the way, Normally, you would get four victory points to cancel most of that out, but I think you have a requirements card, which means actually it's gonna there's a two bonus, you'd actually get six. So I don't know this either, but if I put a construction there, you see that requirements every report of buildup that's you know is gonna earn you another two VP. Ah, right that there, means yeah. you'd more than cancel out. I would have basically ended up scoring negative one, negative that, one. but I don't know that. And I'm picking now. Gazmata instead of Guadalcanal because it's a little bit out of the way. 
but maybe I've given it up with the army. I don't know. Now I get to, it's hard for me to, I'm the game strategy. So I don't really know, you know what is a good move, but I'll just go. That's one of my build up actions. Now right. I have construction battalions asset. So if you look at the Japanese player uh, window again, I'm going to show that now. It says show for up to one free build up action each preparations phase. We're in the preparations right. phase. I'm going to show you that card. I would like put it out on the table and play that card essentially. I get to keep it, but you know I have construction battalions. And what that means up actions if I build the right kind of thing is free every turn. And that's pretty right. valuable because I only get two. So I can say, so well, I use you this. Gonna, you're going to use it. We like we can just like play it. Yeah. Le Leave it yep. up on the table and because you, you're going to get to yeah. use it every turn yeah. now. Exactly. In fact, your refugees escape mission says show immediately. That right. also would be out. That would be a reminder to, to me that you've got refugees out there somewhere. Okay. Right. So that actually would already be out. There we go. Um, okay. So one of the rules, the standard rules in this game is you always announce the type of action you're taking. So I have to declare two things. One, I'm doing a buildup action, not an augment, not a ready. It's a buildup action, which suggests to you, I did, I built something somewhere, right? I put something out there, right? Because I'm going to tell you, close your eyes, I'm going to do it. The other thing is I have to, to show I'm using construction battalions to do that. And so you can see I've done a free buildup action to place troops, supplies, and or, or construction. I mean, I could just show you that card, but why would I waste it unless I'm really trying to deceive you? So you can now have a pretty good bet. Somewhere out there in the Japanese territory is a troops, supplies, or construction. Right. Since the scenario is what it is, I might hope you conclude that's Guadalcanal or the Central Solomons where I'm building that airfield. Right. And I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try and trick you. I'm going to do it at Gazmar, let's say, for example. You can do, uh, so you, uh, which one are you going to build? So what I did was I put, you just put that construction at Gazmata, Yeah. right? That's one of the ones, like I use construction battalions for that. And right. it's free in effect. So I still that got two. Free, still got two actions, right? Still got two actions left. So now... I could ready more patrols or draw a card or put down another buildup. I think I'm going to put down another buildup. I'm just going to go ahead and follow the same lead, and I'll, we'll put, put them at Finchhofen. So just uh, Finchhofen is in New Guinea. It's just to the west of Gazmata at the top of the map. Right here. Right there, yeah. Just because I'm thinking it's an out-of-the-way place, I'm going to put right. construction there. Construction there as well. Okay. Yeah. Just because I'm thinking you're not going to look there. Uh, okay. And now I've got one left. One I'm left, a little yep. frustrated that Tanaka doesn't help me. So I'm going <laughs> to use that to draw an asset. And, you know, if you want to play fair, I should have actually drawn two. So we could go ahead and just draw onto yeah. the Japanese. Where is, is it on the setup information? Or how does, how do, how do we have it now? Uh, try, I think the cards are here. Right. So the left column, if I remember, are discarded cards that we don't draw from. So right. I'm going to be drawing two random cards, one I should have gotten in set up, and then one I'm using my action to take. It's a random draw. You should be able to draw off of that right hand yeah, so yellow. Draw, oh, draw multiple ah, cards and take two. Great. Sure. Right into the Japanese window, and let's see what we can get. There you go. Okay, so uh, news broadcast and general tactics. I still have no, I was hoping to get an air or sea patrol to show you show uh, you guys how this worked, but we don't have that. Um, but we have uh, news broadcast. That's going to help me get some free information on you. I'm going to keep that in my pocket for now. And then jungle tactics is uh, I can, this is going to help me search and find Coast Watchers, which is great because that's a great match with security. Uh, mm -hmm. So that kind of, you know, I'm going to be trying, I'm going to be coming after you hard to try to capture some of you guys. Okay. Right. So I've done my free build up with con construction battalions and then my 
mitigation actions, which were another buildup. You know that I would say I'm doing another buildup. I ask you to close your eyes and switch out the marker and an augment. And you'd see me draw a card. You don't know what it is, but I got a card. So that's my preparation. So that phase is done. So now it's your turn with your first allied activities. So I right. think there's actually Vassal even has an advance end of phase button at the top there. You can hit, hit that. Oh. Yeah. The, just at the top there, you hit that. And you can see on the uh, track mark. Yeah. Right, that right we've gone, we just like gone from oh, yeah. phase one, yeah. Japanese preparations to phase two allied. That's like the Japanese color is kind of that uh, khaki looking thing. And the allies have that aqua color. And okay. Now. So, so now. now this right and for that we, if we go to my card uh it's the is it just the actions at the top or is it from the both so here? let's it's it's all of them so let's them. uh yeah let's back out uh so we can see the whole card if you can or you can look at the, the shared the common information at left Go to the common information tab at the top left of right. the yep. of that. Yeah. Okay. So the top left box, the turn sequence, you can see one was Japanese preparations. That's what we just did. Now yep. comes Allied. And this has the A, B, C, D. You can do up to five of any of those four flavors of things. And within those, there are other options, right? But you have to do all the deliver A before any operate. And you have to do right. all the operate before any evade and all the evade before any train. That's the A, B, C, D. Uh -huh. okay. Within that, there's some options too. So now let's go back to the allied information. Okay, so you see the boxes, A, B, C, D, right. same order, right? Okay, yep. so first, deliver. This has to do with using your boats and your Catalina to move people and stuff. Do that or not, it's up to you. But when you're done with that, then you go on to operate. Right. Operate. Right. I could do all is, five delivers if I wanted. You could do, well, if you had five delivery assets, you could. Right, right. But each of your delivery assets, it says use once per phase. Right. So you can do right. one thing with your boats and one thing with the cab, Catalina, then you would be done. Right. Operate, you can do five operates and that's all you're doing. Um, And then, but an operate is, operate is your main mission. It's kind of like actually doing something to to, to yield intelligence value. And that's mainly uh, observe, recruit and resist. I'll talk about a little bit, but you're not going to be using those much. And here's why. That has to do with guerrilla warfare. And there was some guerrilla warfare that the Coast Watchers participated in, but it was absolutely not the main idea. In fact, the whole ethos of the Coast Watching program was basically quiet and peaceful and only defend yourself if you have to because the Japanese are coming at you. Uh, that changed over time and there was more guerrilla activity. But the idea was you're too valuable to, as a quiet reporter, as a spy, to have you going out and, you know, shooting people and blowing stuff up. So from time to time in this game, there's some resistance going on, some guerrilla warfare. And that's what recruit and resist have to do with but you have to actually be assigned that mission and you weren't. So if anything, the gorillas for you are a liability because if they right. get captured, the Japanese get points. Right. So I that means, them, I think. yeah, you've got one and you know, don't get them captured, but they're really not doing you any good because it's not your mission. Right. And so when we look at operate, it's really observe. That's the main thing. And, the, and almost a question is for the coast watchers, it's almost like a measure of performance. How many observe actions are you getting out? You know, trying to find, I've got two buildups out there, right? Now I might've faked it. I might've just done nothing, you know, or to fool you, but I, these are very precious actions for me. So probably there's stuff out there for you to find. How many observe actions are you going to be able to do during the turn? Because you've got five actions each phase and you've also got to deliver. You've got some refugees to worry about. You want to insert more Coast Watchers. You're going to need to resupply. Uh, to stay hidden, because if you don't have enough food, you can't hide. You have to come out to the villages and ask for food. You're going to get, you know, arrested. And if anybody's exposed, you're going to want to evade them. And you're probably going to want to fill out your network 
through training more Coast Watchers. Well, you've only got five actions. So how many of those are going to be that core action of operate? We'll have to see. Right. Okay. The, the, the training, the training gets me more uh, Coast Watchers into the ready box here. Correct. Because right now, I think I've, yeah, I've only got, I've only got two to mess with. Yeah, so. you've got two ready to go to insert. And, uh, you know, if you wanted to, well, when you have a look at that bombing mission, you know, if you look at your network right now, you don't have a lot of warning uh, to provide Port Moresby. Between right. uh, Rabal, Caviang, and Port Moresby, there isn't much. <laughs> so, so that might be a, uh, you might be something to invest in. And you might decide, I had two patrols. I put one down in Guadalcanal. That, that's not surprising. I put one in Gazmata. What the heck was that? It's not even a base. Why did I do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You might decide, I did that because I'm trying to clear the way for this bombing mission. I yeah. But, but it, anyway, it, these are all just examples. It's But it's also like scary for me to put a Coast Watcher right right beside where, right into Gazmata as well, right? Well, there's that. But maybe you don't put them in Gazmata. Maybe you put them next door in, uh, you've got them, one in Pondo already. You put them in Talisea or right. maybe even closer to Port Marsby uh, in uh, Salamoa Buna, for example. I don't know. I mean, right. I'm just, uh, this is all just Mooney spooning around. You know, I'm just giving you options. Uh, but the bottom line is you've got five actions. What do you want to do with them? Well, uh, I think we'll start with it. Uh, I will insert my two uh, Coast Watchers that are already ready. Okay. And I, I'm not going to go into Gazmata. I, I know you did something there, but I think I... I mean, I, I sort of I know this is a, this is tricky to decide what to do because we actually are seeing what the other person does. So there's no correct. We're, we're not getting the uh, the fog of war that you would get playing a game. But I you kind of have to know, protect the fog part. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I you know I might have gone for an insert here at the uh, Talasia, uh, uh, and okay. uh, you know as kind of like between that and Pondo trying to. Uh, creep up on the Gazmata. Uh, okay. Makes sense. So, well, so I'd insert a CW there and it's going to so tell me. Let's go through this step by step before you actually do it. Sure. Because it's not a sure thing because I'm going to try oh. and stop you. Okay. So there's a. <laughs> yeah. The enemy gets a vote. Don't forget. Oh, yeah. So well, let's go to insert. Let's go to the play aid. Right here. Yes, of course. All right. So first of all, so if we look at deliver up top, that A, deliver, that applies to all four flavors of deliver, including insert. It says at hidden blocks. So first of all, there's a requirement. Hidden means the block is standing up and I can't see it. Revealed right. is it's flat. Revealed means I'm on you. You know, I'm hounding you down. You know, right. you're not getting on the radio and ordering a Catalina to land off the beach because the chat you right so right. right away that's a requirement is well talisea where you just pointing that's a hidden block check right. great okay next thing show delivery asset used in other words you've got to assign a delivery asset to do this insertion that's your blue cards you have two delivery assets boats and catalina so let's look at those because you're going to have to assign one of those and you're going to tell me Show it to use it, and you're going to use it. It's only used once per phase for each of these. So you're going right. to basically, you know, tap it if you like uh, yeah. to use. Okay. okay. So and so yeah. you've got a hitch with boats. So the fine print on boats is use once per phase for insert, rescue, or resupply within range two. That's two spaces, range two of allied held and not be a no C, or you can use it for retrieve at any range. Well, you're doing insert. So this yeah. range two from allied held applies. So let's look at Talisea. All right. Good. You cannot go two spaces yeah. and get to allied held. And even with crossing no C, which you're not allowed to, it'd be three spaces to Kirawina. So your boats are operating locally. You can't go, you can't get from, Australia or Port Moresby 
to Talisea with a boat. Right. So I'm you're using your, it. it's got to be the Catalina. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now you're assigning the Catalina, use once per phase, and that's it. It's got a range of anywhere, right? You can right. use it anywhere. Great. Okay. Use once per phase. Resupply is not the mission. The mission is insert. Right. We're going to do this. That's, and now it lists for you the how you're going to set up the delivery cup. There's going to be three of those red sighting markers and nine nothing markers. What does that mean? Right. You're going to be pulling out two, and you don't want to pull the red ones. So, all right, because it's an ahead. airdrop. You, yeah. So we go to the cup area. We go to the cup, and it's the delivery you've got cup. A delivery. Yeah. And what would you would be doing physically is you'd be taking three of the red ones and nine of the green ones and throw them in the cup. Throw them in the cup, right? And I and which is basically what I'm going to do here. I'm going to say populate the cup with three sighting, nine nothing, right? Correct. Okay. Now, now you would be announcing some of this. You'd be announcing which asset you're using. You'd be announcing that what type of action it is. You'd be saying, I'm doing an insert. I'm going now, to do an insert with the Catalina. Right? I'm also listening to your signals or whatever. I've got some information. I know you're going to put in a coast watcher somewhere. Now I don't know where. Right. I don't. I don't have to say that where it is. I say I'm doing an insert right. with my Catalina. Right. And here's the cup. And now I have a chance to improve my chances of catching you in the act because I've got a bunch of asset cards in my deck that are either air patrol or sea patrol. I just don't happen to have any in this game. But here's what they look like. Um. There's zeros, destroyers, barges, flying boats, things that are patrolling around looking for allied Catalinas flying in and out of my territory. Okay. When I play those, when I show those, they remove those green markers. They worsen your chances of getting away with this secretly. Uh, well, right. So right now you 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 know politely pause and say, Do you do you want to show Volko? Do you want to show any, you know, sea or air patrol? I'd say I'm going to choose not to go ahead. So now, if you go to how, where is all this written up? If you go to the uh, common information thing again, uh, oops. There you go. Go to the one on the top left, the common information tab. All right. So the lower right delivery cup. This is what we're doing right now. You declare your delivery type, show your asset, prepare the trips. You've done all that. Aren't any Japanese Aero Sea Patrol? So we did B. So we're up to C. You for the delivery, you're just drawing two chits and you're going to read the result. Obviously, this is a blind draw, it's a random from the uh yep. this is the Catalina flying to Talisea and trying to drop off. And you've got the radio, the food, probably a couple guys, some weapons, uniforms, other accoutrement, right? That you're bringing in there. You this is not an airdrop. Right, your Catalina is landing on the water off the beach. The water, you're getting right. into little rubber dinghies at night. You're paddling to the beach with your stuff, and you're hoping that nobody who doesn't like you sees you do all of that. Okay, so that's what's happening right now. All right, so I'll draw off two of these delivery chits, and we'll see what I get. Yep. A nothing. Okay. A nothing. And if we right. look at so if you yeah go ahead. This, uh, so zero sightings, missed success. Block stays hidden. Switch any blocks secretly. Right. So that is obviously exactly the result you wanted. Nobody spotted you. None's the wiser. So now you actually switch the blocks. I would be looking away. You'd and be your coast away. watcher goes in. And I do this insert of a coast watcher, and it's going to say get rid of one from the uh, allied ready box. Because that's where he's coming from when we're playing physically. Yep. Boom. And Boom. That okay. The, and one question: these uh, these nothings that I do they just go back to? Do they get discarded or they, this delivery, they just delivery sit gets, there? They sit there for now because there's a difference. There's two cups: delivery right. cup, patrol cup. Right. The allies running the delivery cup, Japanese running the patrol cup. The delivery cup it resets every time. Right. So here's the asset. Here's the Japanese, whatever, you know, and you're just going to hit that button or and, set. So we can ignore those nothing for now. They'll be, they'll be back. In they'll, the they'll go right back into the, into the mix. Yeah. Whereas the patrol cup, things that come out, stay out. 
The patrol cup is different. And uh, so we'll get to that. That's very, very important. Uh, right. But we'll get to that when I search you with using the patrol cup. Or if you do an observe, we'll use the patrol cup because we'll use it for that. So right. we'll, uh, yeah, let's leave that until we, we should get to that pretty soon. All right. Well, I've done my Catalina. So right I'm now there should be some pawns. Uh, if you go to pieces, just to back along, uh, if you go to pieces, you should see it. Get, grab one of those blue pawns onto the board. So you're going to have five actions, right? So we can keep track of that by putting a pawn in boxes. That kind of doubles as a, you know, an action track oh, yeah. if you want. Right. So right. you could put that pawn in box one. Just shows you've taken yep. your first of five actions this uh, this turn. Okay. Great use of that. And it was a delivery action. So you do still have your boats. Yeah. So yeah, but let me make. So I have to be. This is kind of standard here. Two spaces. Wherever you're going, unless you're doing a retrieve. Out. Yeah, unless you're doing a retrieve, they have to be within two spaces of something that's allied held, not a base, but something that's allied held. Let's do a resupply because this is kind of just work a day, bread and butter. You got to feed your guys. Otherwise, they're going to be yep. and hide in the jungle. So let's look at resupply. How does it work? That's right here. Okay. At Any delivery asset can do asset. it. So that's a, okay. that could be my boats. That's going to be your boats. That's all you got left. Yep. At, it's at a hidden Coast Watchers in Japanese held at greatest range for that delivery asset. I think that's out of date. I think I need to change out. Uh, that's out of date in Vassal. Okay. Um, because that greatest range, it's not even that complicated anymore. Um, so... What the way that works now is simpler. All you have to do is you have to pick a hidden coast watcher somewhere in Japanese territory that you can reach. Is that a range of two still count? It does. So let's look at the map. Where can yeah. you get to this range of two? Not obviously not Talisea or Pondo or those guys in the way north. You have one, I think, only that the boats can reach, and it's Vela La Vela near the bottom. Uh, not oh, not that far in the middle now. Was at the bottom right screen. there. That guy. Look at that guy. So he's actually at range two from Allied Held. Oh, right. Why? Because of Coral Sea. Boom, boom. Right. Exactly right. Right. Yeah. So so because the Allies can always use Coral Sea, the Japanese cannot. This is going to help you here. So you could use your boats to resupply that guy. And why do you want to resupply? What resupply does is it adds very important. Focal, you've uh, you've dropped out or frozen up. I'm on the edge of my seat, wondering what it does add. I see you again. Oh, there you are. Are you back? You I dropped am out back. There for a second. All right. So you're, you're about to say what a, what a resupply does. Yeah. Yeah. So it adds these very important pro allied chits called evasion chits into my patrol cup. And what that represents is right. you're delivering the supplies. So your guys can just hunker down on the hilltops or in the jungle and not have to be going out and asking people for food and getting caught. Right. And that's just something you got to kind of, you know, feed that, <laughs> that, uh, that demand routinely so it's a good thing to do keeps your guys right. safer so, so basically it, it, the it's it, it if we look at this patrol cup it means that i'm adding things to the cup that are good for me and bad for you when you go to that cup yes that's basically what resupply is right all right so let's look at the the resupply uh play it again okay so as I said, that at greatest range business is actually, forget that detail, that's actually uh, overtaken by events. Uh, you can do it with any delivery asset. It has to be a hidden Coast Watcher in Japanese held. That's the requirement. And if you're successful, you add up. 
Simple, simple. We've identified a coast watcher. You would yep. announce to me you're using your boats to do a resupply delivery action. Okay. And again, I don't have to say where. You wouldn't tell me where, uh, but I know that it's within range two of Allied Health because I know it's boats doing it. Okay, fine. That's some information for me. And now you're going to go set up the cup according to boats. I'm going to again announce I have no air sea patrol to go after you, and you're going to draw two chits and see how it goes. Right. And uh, oh, I should look at my uh, the boats. If I'm using boats, it's a two by eight rather Correct. than a three by nine. So we yes. go. We set up the delivery cup with a two by eight, and away we go. Oh, slightly different this time. Okay, unlucky boat. In fact, there's even a boat in the picture sighted. So I spotted your boat. So go look and see what that means. If you'd have to go to the common information where we have the, yep. you're looking for a success course. It means so what does one green, red, one green mean? Success, reveal blocks and switch openly. Yeah, so if you scoot that over, because uh, the screen oh, yeah. right now is not showing it. Thank you. Uh, right. So you still got a success. You got through. You got in and out. The hitch is, I saw you. Right. So uh, basically, I get to put the four, the four evade markers in the patrol cup, but I'm going to have right. to uh, reveal my blocks. So in... whatever blocks were involved... In this case, it's just one, right? Yeah. So going back to, well, first I'll do the cup. Uh, how do we add things to that cup? So on? there should be, if you go to pieces, there sh you should be able to get, uh, I, I, I oh, there are some there, actually. Yeah. There are some there, or you could go to the pieces window, either way. Yeah. It's these guys here. Yeah, it's those little green guys there. There is a, in the, physical game a limit on these by the way there's i think 20 there's some number one. Right? you want four evasion yeah the green ones the ones that are good for you exactly and return to patrol cup then they're now now yeah. the patrol cup is up to 16 Boom. yeah so, that was, so that's uh, healthier for you that that's was good the good for part. you the bad that's part, the good part um at the, Vela Lavella. Vela Lavella, right here. Yep. I have to now reveal this block to you, right? Right. And what you would be doing physically in the game is you'd just be laying that block flat so that you know the symbol is shown straight up. And so there I have to go. do that. Right. And, and on Vassal, it would appear on the screen and I'd see that you were there. Yeah, on your, okay. on your you'd now see that. Yeah. And if I had a patrol there already, this is what it says on about the delivery cup. I would now get a free search there. A free search, it's, yeah, it says right here, yeah. So I'd be using that patrol cup to try to catch you. And that's very dangerous because the searches are much more effective if I'm already on to you. You know, if you're already revealed, right, I'm on your trail. So right. if I follow this boat to your rock, dropping off supplies to you on the beach, that's a lot easier than just, okay, somewhere on this island, you are, right? So right. that would be really bad for you if I had a patrol there. But fortunately for you, I don't. Yes. Uh, but and, but, and I, uh, I I would know that because you, this is your patrol, is these guys, right? Is like the um, army the, and police are patrols. Police. Yeah. Those are patrols. So when I, when I and picked there's, that spot, I knew I wasn't in danger of a patrol. Right. So that's some good news for you. But now here's some bad news. I'm going to go ahead and play one of my cards now. I'm just so if you go to point. the Japanese. I'm just yeah, that's right. This was your second. There. Right. Yeah. Japanese. Uh, so. Oops. There we go. Okay. I'm going to play. I'm going to show and discard news broadcasts. Right. Oh, no, I can't yet. It's turn two or later. Okay, well, okay. I was going to use that. It'll come <laughs> if we were to keep playing. But I wanted to show folks what this looks like. But on turn one, 
it, on an allied success like this, turn two or later, I could basically get rid of your boats. What this represents is uncensored broadcasts revealing the use of these boats for this activity that makes it unsafe either two, which is the scenario, right? So it could actually cost you one of your two deliveries. Right. Uh, but fine print says turn two or later, so you're safe for now. Oh, so man, never mind. That's a, that's a pretty great card. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a one-time use. Um, but, but still, to, and, to and one of my two. Indeed, you turn one, you're safe from it, right? To lose either the boats well, or the Catalina would be pretty bad. That would limit you to just one delivery action per turn. Since you yeah. didn't, there are other, by the way, you could get submarines. Um, you can get PT boats later in the war. Um, there are other delivery assets, but um, there's one called Harris Navy, which is boats up in the um, New Britain area and right. New Guinea. But you didn't get any of those. So oh. yeah, the boats losing the boats would uh, would certainly hurt you. However, you're safe for now, so never mind. Back. That was your second action. That was my second action, and now I've done I've done both all my deliveries that I can because I've used the boats once and the Catalina once. So now I need I can't do any more deliver type actions, right? Right. So now it's time to uh, operate and then later evade or train if I want to. But it sounds like it's time to try to do an observe. Let's do that. Yeah. So. So let's look at operate. We've moved from A to B. And let's look at that operate box. Um, like deliver, you have to be hidden, right? Again, if I'm chasing you, you're not going to be doing a lot of observing and reporting and stuff like that. So right. it has to be at That's a hidden right. Coast Watcher. Obviously, it has yep. to be at a Coast Watcher. It can't be at an empty. It has to be a Coast Watcher doing it. So that's pretty easy. And it, in this case, it has to be because you're not going to be doing all this stuff where it's friendly territory. That's no, no point in that. So that already narrows like where this can happen. Um, and, and you can see Japanese held does that is that Japanese held and Japanese bases when it says Japanese yes. held right it is so though so a Japanese base is always in Japanese just also a, a, a Japanese base right. yes absolutely the difference so is you can see are are held, just held whereas these yellow ones are bases Japanese right Japanese. there's a concentration of activity like a major port or airfield there right. something like yep. that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I'm not going to be deploying. I'm not going to be deploying my warships for a big mission in some cove somewhere. Right. I need a port to support that. Right. Right. Um, so so there's an implication here of this requiring delivery and operate require hidden coast watchers. And the implication is. I can disrupt you if I can do searches to like reveal where you are. I'm like on your trail. I'm narrowing it down, but I haven't caught you yet. You can't operate. Right. You can't deliver. You can't even escape, really. Every time and you have one of my blocks, it makes that block unusable. Unusable until you hide him again. Now, he's easy to hide again. It's one action, evade. It's automatic. He hides. Okay, because that's another day at the office for these Coast Watchers. They're just relocating to a new high up. But notice the sequence, A, B, right. C, D. You don't get to do that during your phase until after you're done with all your deliver and all your operate. Right. Right. So so basically that that Coast Watcher is out of action. It's like losing a, a, losing a go for out of your yes. five actions. And, it, and after every intelligence activities that you get, I get my countermeasures to try to expose you again. So I can try to kind of keep the pressure on you even if I don't actually catch you, I'm blocking you. You know that kind of thing, right? And there must be a there must be a thing here where I, uh, once I manage to flip him over, uh, I might try to move him along one of those lines to to some place where you don't know where he is. There must be something so, like that. Yeah, so this is a problem for you, and was a problem for them. By and large, you're on islands. Right. Or maybe you're along the coast of New Guinea or something, right? So this isn't just like, oh, we're going to walk down the street, you know, to right. go to a new station. 
you're assigned a particular station and you're moving around on Bougainville or at the south end of Bougainville or whatever, you've got boats and that canoes and all that kind of thing. But but you're basically assigned to locality. And if the Japanese are on you, it's actually hard even to get out. Right? right. Like they had a lot of trouble on Bougainville just evacuating people because the Japanese were getting so so hot on their heels. And then finally, the last two Coast Watchers, they had to send a U.S. submarine to go get them. And even so, that's hard to do because the submarine's so, got to service at night. you got to get out the little rubber dinghies and all that. It's, right, you know, right. dangerous. So even, even if you're – if like Bougainville as, a, as an example – if I've got a guy that's been exposed at Buka, it's not easy to to just move him to Buin, which is on the same right. Island. You know the way they would do that? You'd have to go back to Ready and send a new guy in, right? right. You're basically right. assigning people to the station, or you're evacuating them. You're not generally not moving. From um, place to place. Mo you're you're like moving from place to area, but these are pretty big, like. This is like, look at the scale of miles. I mean, Bougainville is a hundred miles long, right? More than that. Right. So you've basically got one coast watcher out. It's moving around from hilltop to hilltop, but it's all at the North end of the Island. Right. And then you've got another one at the South end of the Island. It's also moving around from hill to Valley or whatever, but it's all in that South area. Doing a lot of, I'm walking, you know, I'm switching stations directly right? right there's a there's a little of that but not a lot of that going on so that's not the way it would work now if you look at your missions you've got one that's going to help you in that case which is it's covered up by spies i think but it's called uh oh no it's ex extraction on the left there sorry um there that so so there you go so you can get a revealed coast watcher out with this, this enables you to do that. That's the benefit of this card. Oh, uh, right. You basically, you get a one-time extraction. If you got somebody who's really under pressure, the police are there, you know, and you just want to get them out, uh, that's what that card is there for. It's right. like something in your hip pocket for a really rainy day. Right. The uh, fella Lavella is not in that kind of a tricky situation. Nah, He's I'm not there yet. Be there. Yeah. yeah. Right. All right. So I might as well, that was, uh, that was my third action was that, uh, observe, right? Well, let's, let's, well, we have to, you didn't do an observe yet again. I'm going to try to stop you. <laughs> so, oh. all right. So let's go, let's look at observe and let's go through the procedure at coast watcher and Japanese held. So you're silently picking some place. Do you have a place in mind, a coast watcher who's hidden in Japanese yep. held? Sure. Okay. Okay. So you've got somebody. And then if you, uh, if you slide it over so we can look at the rest of that uh, play aid, this entire box operated, the upper right says draw from patrol cup. You see that? Yeah. Up here. Yep. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to do that. So we're going to get a chance for you to make use of that. Uh, those evasion chits that you put in there. So we're, we're going to have to go through this process, this procedure of it's actually me. I'm drawing from I, are we drawing from the patrol cup now? For you to observe me, you got to get within view, or you got to run some people into my facilities or something. There's a potential that you're by doing this mission, right? So just like with deliver, there's a risk, and the, here that's the risk is the patrol cup. So let's look at the patrol cup. It's different than the delivery cup in a number of ways, and one way that it's different is that it's not always the same number. Pulling. It depends on the patrol status at that location. Right. There might not be any patrol there. There might right. be an army patrol there, or might be the really effective police patrol. And that's what you're pointing to right there. So that means you have to tell me not where you're doing your observe. You've announced it's an observe, but you do have to tell me is there a patrol? And if so, is it army or police? Right. And there's no patrol. Okay, so you're doing an observe where there's no patrol. The risk is relatively low. You're one chit, or actually, I would be drawing it physically, but right. you've got the hands of asshole. So randomly draw one chit from the patrol cup for your observe action. Okay, so it's an evasion. And so the result is zero patrol chits drawn, right? 
Yep. No contact. Search has no other effect. Allied success. That's what you wanted. Allied success. So you're going to get to do your observe. Right. Then at the bottom of that uh, box on patrol cup, we did A, you declared B, we drew, took the result. C, one evasion chit stays, basically stays out of the cup. If any were drawn, other chits go back in the cup. So the patrol cup, unlike the delivery cup, doesn't reset each time. It goes up and down with your resupply missions. And with me, I can feed patrols into there to put more effort against you. And when we use it, unless I have a completely successful patrol, I'm at least consolation prize narrowing in on you. I'm closing in on you gradually, right? abstractly so across the islands. So that evasion chit is, stays out. Right. We put it in the dis discard. Yeah. I would the... just leave it there because what, what I've been doing on Vassal, it, in the physical game, there's a certain number of these chits. I think it's 24. I can't remember the number of these evasion chits. And that matters because you can't improve the situation any, at a certain point, I don't need more bags of rice right. from you. Right. Okay. So that's what that represents. Um, and so we want to maintain that in Vassal. So I end up usually, I just take that number of evasion chits, I put them in this window and I just go in and out manually between right. the patrol cup. And that works quite well. Okay. So now I would be looking away and you'd be checking that Japanese control marker where you did that successful observe mission secretly. I would do a peek. And you do a peek. And if you had something there, you'd report it by changing out that labeled uh, reports box. Right. So I'll just show you so that we sure. Like, yeah. Ready. So for I demo chose, purposes, I chose Buka. Buka. Okay. And I so I you'd peek. peek. You'd see there's nothing there. There. And, and so, so you're going to find a Buka box there. And you would put nothing there. But you know, we have a little uh, marker called clear, which you can right. use just to record for your own background that you looked there. Right. And if you place with clear, if you peek at it, it's palm trees, but it's got, it's like, Palm trees plus it's got a little box, a box around, around it. it. You right. know, it's a little more vivid too. It's it just a you. note, no points, but it's just a note to you. Hey, you did look in Buka. Now I might build something on Buka next turn. Right. Right. So it could change, but still you've got some negative information is still information, right? So yeah, you got something. Uh, absolutely. It. Knowing where you okay. where you put. So that was number three. And I should, I think I'll. Well, is there something else you want to show, or should we do another observe? You could try uh, an observe with spies. And by the way, since that coast watcher on at Buka was remained hidden, there's no restriction on using that same coast watcher station again to do another action, and you could use spies to. For example, you can use spies at Buin if you wanted. Right, because that does the uh, lets you do uh, spy on an adjacent uh, 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 station, right? Correct. There we go. So yeah, that would it. require you to show me spies. You're using that card, so you'd be showing it, and, and you declare and observe. You'd again say there's no patrol there. You'd again draw one chit and hope to succeed with your spies. Yeah. Well, we'll try. We'll try booing. That sounds great. Yeah. So and we would need. And to you'd be using. I would. Yeah, and I would tell you. Um, well, let me have a look at that. Uh, get out that player aid again. Whoops. There's no patrol, so I don't. So it's still just one a one chit draw, right? Correct. All right, here it is. So that was that was an evasion as well. I guess I should have flipped that other one. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Right, they're they're green on the they're different. They look totally different. So that yeah. was another. Yeah, just tells you what it is. And this one stays out as well because. One evasion shit always stays out as per the player aid. Very important. Yeah, to to um, to reduce the number of evasions in the cup. 
And so that was successful. Uh, and that means I would get to peak at Buin, even Correct. though I have no Coast Watcher there. Correct. And I have a look and there's nothing to report, but I would get to do that same thing over here with Buin and go replace with a clear so that. Uh, uh, Might as well. Yeah, there we go. That would be, that, so that was my fourth action. And then for my fifth one. One left. What's that? One action left. One action left, yeah. And I, I think uh, uh, this is where I might do, is this where I can bring something from ready to, no, this is where I can train, I can add a Coast Watcher to ready, it, it, or I could do the evade on the, on the one that's already flipped, which I should probably do the evade, I think. Yeah, I, uh, that makes sense to just uh, do the evade at uh, Vela La Vela. And that just means all I have to do is flip that at a revealed, just hide that block again. That's all I have to do. That's and, it. And that I will do. And that's my fifth. So we would go to... Japanese countermeasures. And, uh, which is you. Right. If you um, take that player aid down for a second. Okay. So go ahead and hit the end of phase button at the top. There we go. So we can see it's, so this is then kind of bread and butter phase as the Japanese is next. And I get five actions called countermeasures, which is all about finding the coast watchers. And these also happen in a certain order. Uh, patrols that I don't need out there anymore. I can search for you actually try to expose your coast watchers out in the field and finally i can add i can deploy i can add more of my ready patrols cup or out into the field so let's say recall is if i've cleared a station out and i don't need a patrol anymore i'm not going to do that so i'm not going to recall um i'm going to go ahead and search uh, a key here with search is I have to have a patrol and I can only do one per phase. I can basically get one crack per phase, if you will. So let's look at um, how that works. But I think first, I think I want to play one of my cards to give myself an advantage here. So yeah, let's play, go ahead and drag out jungle tactics. So I would bring this out to the board and say, I have jungle tactics. And what does this help me do? So the first time you do a, an observe or resist each phase, if it draws one of my patrols, it actually fails. It cancels the success. Well, that didn't happen. But there's another uh, benefit to jungle tactics, and that is it's one of several cards the Japanese have that breaks the sequence of play to the Japanese advantage by allowing a deploy action to proceed searches. So usually I have to do all my searches, then I get to deploy for the next phase. But with jungle tactics, I can do one deploy ahead of time. And I know you have a coast watcher at Vela La Vela. Yeah. So I'm gonna go ahead, my first action is gonna be a deploy, which is to take one of my ready patrols and put it somewhere. I'm gonna take a ready patrol and put it on Vela La Vela. Okay, that's my jungle tactics. Then I'm going to do a search on Vela Lavella. 
or your Coast Watcher, of course. And because it also, uh, it also says on the play aid, uh, add one patrol chip from ready into the patrol cup. It's an or. Oh, it's an or. Sorry, missed the or. There it is. I see the or. I could have done that, but yeah. I chose station. Yep. Okay. So back to back to search. And I'm going to go ahead and use Ishimoto. So let's go ahead and drag him out. You already know I have him anyway. Okay, so he says, show for one search per countermeasures phase in Guadalcanal or Central Solomons to treat army as police. So it has to be his kind of zone of operation for the map, right? So Central Solomons, Vela La Vela is within Central Solomons. So I'm going to yep. declare this is going to be my Ishimoto. He's on Vela La Vela hunting for you, okay? Right. Which means that counts as police right so when i do a search it means declare target block vela la vela and i'm going to be it's as if police so i'm going to get to draw three chits it's instead of the one yeah instead of the one from the patrol cup so go ahead and draw three instead of two army draws two yep Oh, oh dear. So you got two out of the three. Okay, so what does that tell us? This result. So trapped is the result. Uh, the revealed block, a revealed block is taken. Uh, and it says with a note saying if it was search, see exploit. So we'll have to look that up. Uh, and if it was a hidden block, it's revealed. So it was a hidden block because I'd turned it back over, but you have Correct. now revealed it again. So Correct. I, I don't get taken this time, but I do get revealed. But aren't you glad you evaded? I am so glad I evaded. So this goes back to like that. And Correct. Uh, boy, they're on my tail in Vala Lavella now. Now, one evasion stays out, and the other chits drawn go back into the cup. So you can see, I always keep my patrols. They don't go away. I'm just narrowing in by one evasion each time. Right. So the evasion stays out, but these guys go back into the cup. There we go. And that was your first countermeasure action. It was actually my second because I did a deploy with oh, Jungle Tactics. Right. I still have to pay. The only thing Jungle Tactics changes for deploy is when I get to do it. Right. So that was my second. My third is going to be another search. I'm going to search at Gazmata. Because I just put a build up there, you recall, and I don't want you to be able to spot him. And I don't, there might be a Coast Watcher there, I don't know. So I'm going to go ahead and use my army patrol there. This time it's just a normal army patrol. And so that's two chits. Yes. We'll try it this way, see if it works. Looks like you got, oh, come on. There we go. One of each. So one, okay. one patrol chip, which means closing in, revealed block, allied success if it was, if we had to look at, if we needed an allied success. Correct. But all we need is that you did get to reveal my block. Yes. And that was at Gasmata. And there's nothing there. Right, which is nice for me to know. Since I have a I know I have a build up there, I'm happy that you know it's gonna be harder for you to uh observe against it. And again, this uh evade this one evade stays out and the and the army chip goes back in the cup. Correct. 
There we go. Okay. And so that was my that was your third. third. Now I have two left, and I'm going to use both of those to deploy. And this time it's going to be two army chits from ready into the patrol cup. Ah, so those army chits can go into the patrol cup or or the board? Correct. So basically the question is, how much am I concentrating my effort, right? I can spread these guys out through the islands, or I can focus on a few islands and have a lot of guys beating the bushes there, right? So yeah. I can kind of, as the Japanese countermeasures guy, I can kind of tune that, right? That uh, search effort. Right. And so you're going to put two of these into the cup. So I'll Two into the cup. That is a really, that's a really cool mechanic to have the, the uh, army chits work double duty that way. That's really right. interesting. And that's it. So you can end a phase. And, phase. and so we've kind of now gone through a little bit of everything, right? We've yeah. had the Japanese buildup preparations. We've done the uh, allied delivery and, and observe, search and deploy. You know, the only thing we, you know, th th there's other little details or whatever, but that's the, that's the bread and butter. That's the core of the game. And the only thing we really haven't seen is operations and scoring. Right. So we should skip to that. And, and sure. Go right at we it. can kind of just see kind of what does a little bit, what does that look like? Right. Yep. So, um, so let's say, uh, let's, let's take a look at that Japanese bombing operation mission. In the, yeah, the Japanese player. Okay, so let's look at bombing here. So let's. So first of all, it tells you uh, how many victory points it would be worth per target. Has a title, and then it says operation. So with the red word operation, this is a kind of. Not all missions are operations. This one is one, right? The, the, and if we look at your cards, it was. It's the only one that you. It's the only one that I picked this time. Yeah. yeah, the other stuff is other 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 stuff, if you will. Yep. So let's say we've so let's say I want to launch this bombing operation. So it says operation launch three to five. Right. I can't launch this just any time. It right. I have to wait till turn three to do it. And this is just a three turn game, three turn situation. So if bombing is going to launch, it's going to be on turn three. Right. Okay. Just the nature of the the beast. Okay. So let's say we're on turn three. Yep. We've gotten to the Japanese. I'm going to give up my last countermeasures phase and i'm going to launch this operation to end the game the next thing it says is where have i got required oh it's slidden off to the slid off to the oh there you go gotcha excellent yes because that's what i would be doing i would be showing this to you right yeah so then it says required all these missions this require some buildup somewhere this right. requires aircraft at either or both rabal and Kavyang. The big Japanese bases in the right. region, right? These are bombers. So I would have had to place an aircraft buildup at one of those two sometime during the game to be allowed to launch this operation. So let's right. say I did. So let's put an aircraft at Rabal, and I would flip that over to show you. Okay. So then there's targets score points based on targets and the targets have to be allied bases and I can hit one per buildup. Well, in this particular scenario, there is only one base because the Japanese are kind of at their maximum. You know, the allies haven't started pushing back yet. So you've got like this last toehold on the region in Port Moresby. So my bombers are going to start at Rabal and they're going to hit Port Moresby. You know, once I, if I'm using Rabal, that's, they could come from Kaviang. I put them in Rabal. Okay. And then the rest of that text there, E, that refers to situation E. This isn't situation E. This is situation D. So we're hitting Port Moresby. Okay. So now I'm going to use pawns to kind of mark a path. Or I can, as I, I can flip up blocks as I go because sure. I'm going to have to delineate a path for these aircraft to fly for this operation from uh, build up to target and any coast watches you have on the way, you're going to get points for. So I'm going to try to weave around them if I know where they are. So first off, it has to be Rabal. 
So flip over the block at Rabal, the, the, the station. Okay. If you had a Coast Watcher there, that would already be victory points for you because they'd be saying, hey, hey they're coming. Okay. I'm going to go from Rabal. I'm going to go to Pondo. And bingo, I have one. Oh, you have one. Then I'm going to go to Gazmata because I know you don't have one there. Then I'm going right. to go out into the ocean next to New right. Guinea. And then I'm going to go to, um, let's say, Buna. Let's say I pick Buna. So flip, that's uh, just that, that's that one. Yep. There it is. Okay. And then finally, Port Moresby. So you can see having Coast Watchers in your own territory could help you with this warning problem. And they're relatively yeah. safe. Okay. Yeah. So that's my path. So right yeah. off the bat, I'm going to get 15 points for this mission. But the right. guy at Pondo is going to give, he's going to take three points off of that for warning because he's more than two spaces away from Port Moresby. Then right. you're going to, now you're going to score more points. You can have any of your Coast Watchers that are adjacent to that whole path from beginning to end. You're going to flip over now because you get a point for each of those. So there's that one. Yep. And that one. And that includes Rabal. So look up near Rabal. Oh, yeah. We have the... Uh... Yeah, they're just across the uh, the 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 straight there from Rabal, so they're also going to give you a point. So, so that's that was, a, that was three. Yeah, points. so that's three more points. So I got fifteen for it. You you took away six of those points. Yeah, yeah, not great, but you limited the damage somewhat. Yeah. What else are we going to be scoring points for? If I completed any of my other missions. Well, I'm going to show you. I've got buildups at Finchhofen. Yep, that base building mission. I've got a build up at Finchhofen and Gazmata. And I'm going to flip those control markers over and show you because I get five points for each of those. Yeah. Uh, where uh, <laughs> Gazmata, I know where that is. Yeah, Gazmata. So we'll is control that. marker. And yep, and just just uh, up of that, west of that. There you go. So in the game, those would each be worth five points for me. Okay. Right. Then if I took any of your coast watchers, if I had any captives, I'd get three points. Those, right. and I'd get even more because I have a security card. Yeah, I'd actually be getting nine points each for for anybody I took. Well, I didn't. At least I didn't hear. Most games. You know, a lot of games, the you won't see any Coast Watchers taken. It's hard to do. Um, right. A typical game, you probably would see one, something be taken. Uh, the play test, the last play test I did in person, which the other night, uh, they managed to take two of them, um, which I don't know that we've ever seen, seen that before. So that can happen. But it, it, they are hard to take. And generally, the Coast Watcher player is, pretty conservative about keeping them hidden so you know they don't yeah, get captured and um, the Coast watcher in our in the scenario that we were playing tonight i probably would have scored more points if if we'd actually played out to turn three absolutely there's more so, stuff happening you would have gotten more guys in more guys out, uh yeah. you might have gotten you might have been able to report on something you would have had more um guys along the path sure for found sure the uh, build-ups yeah, this isn't a fair test. And anyway, I don't know that these point values are correct anyway. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, which so we're just kind of showing how it works here. So so that's what the Japanese get points for. They're the, now the allies get points as well. They, you got your warning points. If you had any reports that were that were of buildups, you would show those to me. We'd compare them to what's out there, and if it's correct, which is likely to be. You'd get you typically four points, but you've got a requirements mission card, so it's going to add another bonus too. So you get six points for any of those. Right, I've got. To... Then you also get points for if you rescued your um, refugees, you'd get points for that. Um, sometimes you've got some other missions that give you some special bonus points. 
if you so if over the course of play you managed to insert three more coast watchers into my territory and not lose uh, any of them right you get another just a little bonus 2 vp right okay that's that one and then standard, every Coast Watcher you have surviving in my territory is a half a victory point. Oh, right. So I I, I do have a few of those. You, you do, yeah. You've got two, four, six, eight, seven, seven or eight, I guess. Seven, I think. Okay. And during the course of play, you probably would have more, right? You would have put in more. You'd be inserting, training and inserting more, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. Four, four points, five points, whatever. In this case, three and a half, but you'd have more, right? Yep. Okay, so we don't have it here in front of us, but the game comes with a little worksheet, actually, because this is kind of a point salad, right? right. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's a, like a sheet that just is a reminder of all these different things. You can check off what missions you've done, fill in your minus two points here, your plus five points there, whatever, add up the columns, and you get a net score. So who wins the game? Typically, the net score is is going to be some number of Japanese net points. And if you look at the situation information, every situation is going to have a victory level, right. red or blue if it's a negative allied. So this one in the uh, special rule box, there you go, victory. So if my net score reached eight, I would win. If it was if it fell short of eight, because I'm all your points are subtracting from mine you would win. And this is a final kind of knob on the radio. Like if everything else is in tune and these missions are suitably rewarded for their difficulty and it's the right number of points to incentivize you to report on buildups and all of that, but the specific situation is whatever, yielding this or that outcome by how it's put together, then I, we can always change that number. And that's the number that I have no idea really what that number should be at this point. It's going to be the last thing that we're going to nail right. down that, you know, situation D, the victory level should be 12 plus, let's say, or whatever it is. Right. That, that's the, after you, the mechanics are sort of settled. So after a whole bunch of play tests of each scenario, yeah. you, you try and find out what's a, a reasonable threshold for victory. Right. So that's where we really need the data and we really need to have a lot of volunteers playing the game and reporting back, you know, a number of things, but including what was the score in the end, right? So that we can get a sense from, from actual tests, what that number should, should be, or at least about what it should be, right? So that's where the, is the silver bullet because the vassal module means that we can have a lot of people testing without having to construct physical sets, which is a, you know, a big investment and pain in the ass. So, yeah. um, so that's, that's coming once uh, the game is, you know, advertised out there and we have the vassal module the way we want it uh, as you and, and Will are working on, then I'm hoping to, um, you know, put out that, I will put out that call and I'm hoping that we'll have, folks interested enough to, uh, you know, kick around the game and give us some data. Well, um, you do have a publisher. We haven't announced who the publisher is because you're saving that uh, little, uh, let them have the fun of uh, announcing it. But you do have a publisher. This this game uh, will will be coming out. This is not just something you're working on on spec. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I think we've had a good go, but I don't know if we still have any live people watching or not. But uh, if there are any questions, you know, pop them up on the uh, uh, pop them up in the uh, uh, chat box there. But otherwise, uh, I think that that was a, a really good look at uh, at how this game works. Yeah, I think we we toured it pretty well. Thanks, thanks a lot for uh, taking us through that, Grant. I I'm. I was happy to because uh, you know, as I as I told you earlier, it's like I've been work, spending so much time looking at the rules or else working on the module. Uh, I, I haven't actually got to play much. It's just, yeah. it's just like Will and I will go. Uh, w w we should do a. We should do an observe here and make sure that everything works. On, or right. we we should do an insert here. You know, it's 
Uh, I've been That's... doing a lot of mechanics, not a lot of actually uh, playing playing the game and, and thinking yeah. about I mean, what the strategy looks like. Which is so typical of, of game design and game development life is you end up doing a lot of work and, you know, tinkering and tweaking much more than actually playing the thing. And that just right. is universal. Yeah. Do when you're designing a game uh, and it, you're, you go down that road, do you get to the point where like, by the time you put the game out, do you go like, Oh my God, I never want to play this game again. <laughs> or, you know, like. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, kind of, um, you know, I get, I do get to a point where I'm saturated with it. It's not that I don't want to, uh, it's that it's not, it, it doesn't have the freshness for me. Right. And I'm usually I've moved on to the next design project. That's one thing. And the other is I'd like to not just play my own stuff. You know, <laughs> So, I'm, you know, I'm just playing games I like or playing games that I'm interested in because I want to learn something from them, right. you know, for, right. for the right. use in design. And so right. that's what it is. It's not that it's not that I find going back to the previous um because i've spent so much time for them it's just that there's fresher stuff you know that's more that right. therefore is more exciting but for example when something happens like like on rally the troops when andy and abyss uh, appeared on rally the troops i played a lot of andy and abyss even though you know i played a lot of yeah, yeah. a lot of volume one but it was just it was just really cool to have it be on that platform and so i spent a lot of time on that and that was very enjoyable uh, at a convention recently, I was playing with a designer, uh, a, a pro prototype, uh, Sam, L Sam London, his game uh, Firefight Tactical, I think it's called, or something like that. And we played like Scenario 6 or something. Just He just happened to have put it out on the table and he said, oh my God, I'm so glad to not be playing Scenario 1. I, like if I never play <laughs> training scenario again, I'll be so happy. And right. I, I, I could see that like getting a burnout on the training scenario for sure. Yeah, uh, you do end up, if you're doing demos, you know, you end up doing the shorter, you know, learning scenarios more than anything else. And that and that's, you like to move on uh, well, and see other we, parts of it. Look at scenario D, because I have played mm -hmm. the training, the first scenario here, and it right. there's only a couple of actions possible in that. Whereas mm -hmm. uh, what we did tonight had, we got to have a look at a lot of the different actions. Uh, yeah. And, uh, I have to also say, um, good to hear that you like to still play other people's games. I, I'm always a bit suspicious of designers who say I don't, I don't play anything anymore because I think, uh, yeah, keep up with the, uh, keep up with the industry or, or, or absolutely, keep up with what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, I, I mean, I'm not doing this to make a living, right? I mean, this is fun. It's my hobby, so I want to have fun, and you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's a lot of, it's a different kind of designing games is a joy, but it's a different kind of joy than than just playing them to play them, right? And so that's number one. And and it, um, but the other thing is, yeah, I, it, there's a state of the art. And just like about rules writing, we were talking about, um, you know, th the way we design these games now, it's just there's a lot more in the toolbox than there was 40 years ago, right? And I'm experimenting myself, and I'm trying to build what I'm, but I. I absolutely learn a lot from other games and borrow amply you know i mean i'm not shy about oh that works really well but i have another purpose for that in my design i'm going to use that of course yeah you, you know even if you're yeah. so if you were working say exclusively on card driven games say you 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 know you d designed wilderness war and you decided you were going to just keep going down that path if you didn't also look at what say Paths to Glory or uh, Semenich's um, uh, Roman uh, early uh, Hannibal game, you know, you you would have never seen uh, ideas of where CDGs could go, right? And just right. like those guys were looking at your game and going, "Oh, that's an interesting use of, yeah. of well, whatever." That's it. That's a actually spot on because Wilderness War, as you mentioned, now I was you know, really just starting out there, right? It was my first sort of independent design. And I didn't say, okay, well, I'm going to try to be, I'm going to innovate and push the, I mean, I, I was just starting out. So it was kind of, if I took Simonich's Hannibal Rome versus Carthage, 
and I put it in the French and Indian War, how would that work? That was my starting idea for William's War, right? That's and Paths idea. of Glory, one thing that Paths of Glory brought in was specific reinforcement cards. There were a couple of them in Hannibal um, for specialized units. But, but the main way that you're augmenting forces in Paths of Glory is cards providing that flow and that was very appropriate i thought to the french and indian war because your regular reinforcement units not your you know indigenous allies but your european units they're coming from far away and they're being sent it's outside you're the theater commander you kind of get what you get you know right they're just going to yeah. send hey we're sending you a couple of, of of battalions great thank you right that's the cards for those units being dealt to you in wilderness war but the way that that works mechanically, that came from Paths of Glory. Right. The, the combat system in Wilderness War, the CRT, if you will, it's not exactly Paths of Glory. It's actually much more like an earlier Ted Racer game called All Quiet on the Western Front. And if you look at that combat resolution in All Quiet on the Western Front, it's an ancestor, a common ancestor to both Paths of Glory, because Ted refined it for paths of glory with like the resilience factor of the units. And it's also an ancestor of wilderness war, uh, combat resolution. So that's, you know, that's why there is a state of the art, right? We're all kind of feeding off of each other and it's, and therefore it's absolutely essential to play other people's games. I think to, to be yeah. a, a competent designer. I, and yeah, I, totally agree I just that. used to not have so much time to do it because I had, you know, work and family and all that stuff, but now I'm retired. So I get to do it. So I'm going to do it. Uh, a sweet, sweet deal for you. Well, yeah. uh, you know, we've we've been going three hours, I think. So uh, we should probably wrap it up. But uh, this was terrific. I think people are going to be so excited uh, to learn about this new game and and see your first go at World War II. I think this is your first go at World War II, right? Uh, so outside it, of some combat commander scenarios and right, campaigns, right. that's correct. Yes, you're a big fan of... Uh, Combat Commander Pacific, if I especially, remember. yeah, probably my favorite all-around war game. Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, I mean, uh, rest in peace, Chad. But that's uh, high praise. Well, yeah. uh, thanks very much. Uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up there, Volko. Thanks for being my guest, and uh, thanks to everybody who uh, watched. And uh, in a few days, uh, I'll have this uh, out on my channel as well, so it'll be out uh, released to the wider world. Good night. Thanks all and good night.